All right, we're going to get started, everybody. No, no, I see it. And uh, I want to welcome everyone to the November 5th, 2018, regular meeting of uh, the Village Council of Yellow Springs. And Judy, if you could please do the roll call. Yeah, House. Yes. McQueen. Here. Hempley is not yet here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Also present. And Hempling. Here. Yes. Uh, Planning Administrator Denise Swinger. Finance Director no, no, Colleen Harris. Uh, Village Manager Patty Bates. And Village Solicitor Chris Conard. Okay. Uh, any announcements? Uh, uh, wow, none. Uh, All right, I Lisa? do. I do have one, but I'm just getting my act together to do it. But I can go first if no one else. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, I, a couple of council meetings ago, I mentioned that out of Art and Culture Commission, um, a teacher from um, Mills Lawn, Kevin Lighty, is going to be making banners that are going to be along the main drag in town in honor of uh, Women's History Month. And he has um, reached out to say that he would like recommendations from the village and from the community for um, women who might be featured. Um, he had a list of people who had been um, featured in a past project at the high school. Uh, Louise Solberg, Virginia Hamilton, Jean Hudson, Professor Rebecca Pinnell, Coretta Scott King, Olympia Brown, Barbara Reynolds, founders of Glen Helen, and Elaine Comigas. I think Comages. Apologies for that. So they could be on the uh, list of potential subjects, but he would need many more. And so the names all are brought forward, and then the students pick from among the people on the list, and then they do research about the woman and then they make a banner about the woman and write about her and make a flag. So if anybody has any recommendations, um, they can come to me um, at the council or maybe, I don't know, I don't want to sign up Judy, but you can reach me via email. I would love to have some recommendations. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Um, well. Of course, one very important announcement is tomorrow is Election Day. So if mm. you have not voted early, please make sure that you vote tomorrow. Uh, it's very important, and it's your part of your civic duty. Uh, very important election, as always. Uh, the polls start at open at 6.30, close at 7.30. And um, if you are Yellow Springs resident and some Miami Township residents, you will be going to Antioch University Midwest. Um, the other things I wanted to mention, uh, is that um, actually this was kind of a shout out to our team that uh, it's International GIS Day <laughs> on November 14th. So let's make sure to celebrate that. Um, the county is actually giving um, municipalities some money back for permanent infrastructure projects. So Yellow Springs will get uh, just over 22,000 to uh, uh, spend on something next year. So we will be talking about something infrastructure, economic, community development related for that um, uh, disbursement. Hopefully that will be something that continues given the loss of the uh, local government fund that we've experienced uh, over the past 10 years. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, there was a a funny little kerfuffle, I thought, on our Facebook page, but it reminded me that I wanted to thank our village team for really stepping up on the Facebook page. I know Patty, Johnny Burns, um, Ruth Ann, and Judy do a lot of that work. And uh, for anybody that's ever run a Facebook page and you know all the comments you get from the public and trying to keep up with that, this has just added another layer to everyone's work. But we want to do this out of accountability and transparency and allowing people to participate to the maximum ability possible. So I just mentioned, if you see something that accidentally gets put on our page, instead of putting it on open discussion, you could just let somebody know that that probably looks like uh, it wasn't supposed to be on there, which reminded me of my last announcement because uh, it was beard related. Um, November is uh, uh, no shave November, which is something that uh, 
Many do out of recognition of um, cancer patients, and one of the recommendations is to spend uh, the money uh, that you would normally use to take care of your hair uh, to donate to the American Cancer Society. So uh, you probably can't tell, you might want to do a close up, but I'm trying to do No Shave November. Uh, you probably won't notice for a couple more weeks. And uh, uh, finally, uh, Colleen, could you um, come up and tell us for the Roundup program if you um, get, a, what do you call it when your money's taken out of your account, how you can, so if you're paperless, how you can still participate? Okay, for everybody who does have the ACH, where your payment's automatically um, sent to us, you can still call the office and we can make sure that we can get you in the system as a Roundup um, customer. What, what we have now, the first invoices that went out, there's a little bottom piece that will um, take your signature and that allows us the authority in the office to set you up. That rounds up to the nearest dollar and those monies get set aside for any um, of the people that we've been talking about for the last month that might need some assistance in their utility bills to keep them from shut off. This will take a while to generate um, the revenue unless we have donations. So we also have a place on the invoice that you can put a donation in. So anybody that automatically has the ACH, they can just contact our office and we can Again, get a, a form signed, a little initial that says you want this done and we'll get you in the system and then that will automatically round up. If you have a fixed amount that you want to donate and it's the same every month, the same thing, we can set your account and let's say you want to round up to the nearest dollar and always add another $5. As long as it's consistent, we can put you in the system. For anybody that just wants to do it when they feel like they would like to do it, just handwrite it on your bill when you send in your check and add it to your check amount. And again, those monies get put aside there from the users for our citizens. Thanks, Colleen. And the best number to call is? Oh, golly. You know, being the new <laughs> one, and um, so we, will, we will get no. that okay, one. Okay, we'll, we'll post it. It's the utility no. number that's on the invoice Great. that you get. Nine, three, seven. We should have it numbered. <laughs> seven, six, seven. seven. And I'd like to add that um, Three of us up here were guinea pigs or beta testers. So Lisa, myself, and Patty, um, we actually, our bills for this month actually have all the new information on it. And so everything looks great. Uh, I've signed up and brought a little extra down. So yeah, it, it looks good and it's pretty straightforward. So I would encourage everyone to not just do the roundup, but also add a little extra from time to time. All right. Awesome. Yeah, the best number to call is 937-767-7202, option two. Thank you. So, so, and just so people understand, the utility roundup is a way that people who have a little extra money can put, can put that money in their utility bill. It'll go into a fund for people who are having hardship. And there's a whole process set up about that. And, and to clarify one more time, just let us know that that is for the utility roundup. We do, from time to time, have people round up their, their bill also. If it's not specified, it goes into your own account. So if somebody adds a little extra to it and it doesn't say utility roundup, you'll have a credit on your bill. A lot of people do that also. So just specify if you want the roundup program when you make your donation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Um, so yeah, let's make sure to put a Facebook post about that. Um, and uh, it would also be good to write a press release to let um, other communities know that uh, this is a great thing to do. Um, okay, great. Uh, so the consent agenda, we have one item, which are the minutes from our last meeting. And I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, as we review the agenda, I just wanted to mention uh, two things um, because I know Judy's put them in emails to us, but um, one of them is, uh, well, they're both related to adding things to the agenda, which I'm not saying we shouldn't do, but just as a reminder, remember last meeting we finished on time and we did not add anything to the agenda. And secondly, we always want to be cautious because when we do add things, um, that doesn't get into the newspaper, so people might not be here that would want to speak on it. Um, so that being said, uh, any things that we need to modify for the agenda? 
I'd like to add um, a very, very, very brief introductory conversation about transient, transient lodging or transient housing. Um, I, if Chris wouldn't mind, I'd like for him to just come up and introduce at that moment uh, the, the mm -hmm. work he's been doing just to let us know what we can look forward to at a future meeting. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. We'll add that to new business. Anything else? Well, there's been changes. Are you going to note them? Um, sure, I can. Uh, so on the current agenda that's out front, uh, there was an adjustment to the description of the letter that Judith Hempfling submitted that Mary Ann will uh, explain in a minute. And then we clarified under special reports that as a follow-up to our October 31st uh, special meeting on the budget, that we may be following up with a few items depending on uh, the time for that. Um, but uh, we also have three more meetings, I expect, where we will be talking about the budget, so this is an ongoing discussion. Okay, anything else? Great. Um, all right, Marianne, petitions and communications. Yes, we had um, several petitions and communications. Rachel. McKinney uh, submitted the quarterly treasures report. McKinley. McKinley. Sorry. Uh, Arnold Adolph submitted a uh, letter in support of continuing the work of the justice system task force. Marsha Walgren submitted both the uh, EPA uh, response to the Vernay uh, cleanup proposal as well as some additional information about that. Uh, I uh, had in the packet uh, a draft that we had uh, looked at, that council had looked at last year uh, about Sanctuary Village, which we turned into being a welcoming community, as well as the final uh, uh, resolution, because I understood that there might be some people that wanted to talk about that. Um, Judith Hempfling uh, submitted a letter uh, clarifying village government support and partnerships with uh, organizations such as Home Inc., the Council Land Trust. Mitzi Miller had a letter uh, concerned about the village uh, contributing to the affordable housing projects with Home Inc. Uh, the ACLU had a letter in support of the resolution, the resolution of ordinance that we're going to pass about surveillance. And Lisa and I had submitted a request for a budget item for professional services to do an uh, organizational assessment of the YSPD. Okay. Thank you. That did appear in the budget, special budget meeting packet but it didn't carry through, so it's not entirely new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay, let's move into legislation then. And um, Judy, if you could read in Ordinance 2018-39, title only. Yes, this is approving the 2018 Supplemental Appropriations for the third quarter for the Village of Yellow Springs. I did it again. For the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, Colleen. Okay, the supplemental was a request for additional money for our preparations. Uh, we requested 13,000 in the general fund and that was for um, legal expenses and my part-time employee wage. We asked for $30,200 in the special revenue funds, and that is for sidewalk repairs, again, some extra labor and um, internet support costs. Then we asked for $265,500 in the enterprise, mainly the additional needed for our power solar costs, and then some wages. That brings a total for the supplemental request of $308,700, bringing the total budget of this year to $11,481,386. Okay. Um, and this is a second reading, so I'm going to open the public hearing. We've talked about these items before. 
Uh, do council members have any questions or comments for Colleen? Uh, citizens, any questions or comments? All right, if not, Judy, could you call the roll? Yes, McQueen. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hausch. Yes. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you. All right. Um, <coughs> next up, we have a, well, we have several pieces of legislation that are part of our ongoing uh, work to continue to refine our um, zoning uh, and uh, zoning code. And uh, Denise, I'm going to have you come up and kind of give us an overview of what most of these are about, and then we'll go through them one by one. Okay. Um, in, as you know, in 2013, we had a complete uh, rewrite of the zoning code. And uh, over the past several years since I've been in this position, I've had people that have called asking, you know, some questions relating to the zoning code and what they can do with their property um, with the fact that there has been um, a goal of infill that is stated not only in the comprehensive plan but as well as the vision plan. Planning Commission started looking at uh, the code specifically focusing on 126002 with the minimum lot frontage and um, wanted to get more clarification on that as well as um, some other sections. So I'm briefly going to try to just go through um, the sections that you're going to be doing a second reading on tonight. Uh, 122611 for minor subdivisions, it's going to allow um, the subdivision of land. It already allows um, land located along a private street or access easement in the zoning code, but under minor subdiv subdivisions in the planning section, um, it is going to uh, also allow that if certain requirements are met. Um, and 122612 for replats, the same thing, um, because you are allowed to have a private street or access easement within the zoning code. Um, we're also adding some language into the planning for replats if certain requirements are met. For 122613, it just has the related subdivision fees for that. And the fee is a little higher because we are going to require that um, these types of special replats um, where you have an access easement or a private street um, is going to require planning commission approval. So they'll have to come before the planning commission. Um, 126002 minimum lot frontage, we're just clarifying an existing language so it's easier for people to understand. Um, 126003 driveway standards access easements. Um, was adding to parking and storage. Um, there was nothing really in our code um, specific to driveway standards. Um, very brief information on single family. So I, I did contact the, the fire chief um, to get uh, specific information on what he wanted to see as far as a private street or an access easement uh, for a, uh, a essential service vehicle to be able to reach it. Um, it also existing access easement language was added um, to ensure that they're recorded on the deeds of all affected properties. And then lastly, um, well, there's a section on, uh, we're adding the definition of a tiny home. And then under specific requirements, we're spelling out the different types of tiny homes that Green County Building Regulations, we sat down with them, um, what is specifically needed, whether you buy a, a tiny home out of state, um, what you need, what documentation you need to have for that, um, just to clarify in uh, more detail what we will accept as a tiny home. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Denise. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'll just reiterate: um, many of these are to have consistency around conformity for our frontage standards for zoning and then tying up a few loose ends like the tiny homes which are already part of our zoning. Um, so with that, uh, Judy, if you want to read in by title only, starting with uh, 2018-40. All right. This is repealing section 1284.09 definitions T through U of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and adopting new section 1284.09 definitions T through U. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right, um, so uh, this is the second reading, uh, so I will open the public hearing. First of all, any questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? Okay, if not, 
Judy, uh, could you do the roll call, please? Yes, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hempley. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right. Next, we have uh, Ordinance 201841 by title only again. All right. This is repealing Section 1260.04 uses of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and adopting new Section 1260.04 uses. Okay. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, second reading. We're going to open the public hearing. Questions or comments from council members? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. Judy, the roll call, please. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Humphling. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right. Uh, next, 2018. Did, did you open a public hearing? Mm -hmm. Yep. You okay. Yeah. You did close your again. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. I mean, I, I figured, yeah, most of these are really housekeeping, so. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's got to follow our formalities, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Ordinance 2018-42, title only, please. This is repealing Section 1260.03, Parking and Storage of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and adopting new Section 1260.03, Driveway Standards, Access Easements, Parking and Storage. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. I move. A second. second. <laughs> All right. Uh, another second reading, so I will open the public hearing. Uh, questions or comments from anyone? All right, if not, I will close the public hearing. And Judy, if you could do the roll call. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempley. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right, 2018-43, again by title only. This is, this is repealing section 1260.02, dimensional provisions of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and adopting new section 1260.02, dimensional provisions. I'll entertain a motion. So move. Second. All right, uh, another second reading, and I'll open the public hearing. Any questions or comments? Um, if, Judy, if you could scroll up so that everybody could see. Sorry, she's going so fast. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. No other comments for me. All right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so if there are no other comments or questions, I'll close the public hearing. And Judy, if you could do the roll call. Yes, Krieger. Yes. Hempling. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right. 2018-44 uh, by title only. This is repealing section 1226.11, minor subdivisions of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and adopting new section 1226.11, minor subdivisions. All right. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. Uh, another public hearing, because it's a second reading, uh, which I will open. Any questions or comments? All right. If not, I will close the public hearing. And Judy, if you could uh, give us the roll call. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right, 2018-45, title only, please. This is repealing section 1226.12, replats of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and adopting new section 1226.12, replats. Okay, can I get a motion? I so, move. Second. Okay. All right, uh, this is a second reading, so opening a public hearing. Any questions or comments? All right, I will close the public hearing, and Judy, uh, please give the roll call. Hempling. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Housh. Yes. Okay. And I believe this is the last one, 2018-46 by title only. This is repealing section 1226.13, subdivision fees of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and adopting new section 1226.13, subdivision fees. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. I will once again open the public hearing. Any questions or comments? All right, then I will close the public hearing. And uh, Judy, uh, roll call, please. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Housh. Yes. Brian, I would just like to take a minute to thank Denise and the Planning Commission mm -hmm. and Legal for all the work that they're putting into these revisions. It, they seem like they're you know, a little nitpicky, but they take a lot of time mm -hmm. to sort through, and I really appreciate what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will move into uh, a piece of legislation, Ordinance 2018-47, which uh, I would like to read in full. Okay. 
This is an acting new, ch new chapter 607 entitled Use of Surveillance Technology of the Codified Ordinances of Yellow Springs, Ohio. <coughs> Whereas surveillance technologies are being implemented by law enforcement departments across the United States that could have a significant impact on civil rights and civil liberties, and whereas Village Council has determined that it is in the best interest of the Village of Yellow Springs to require a public hearing before any such technology is acquired or used by the Village, and whereas Village Council finds it is essential to have an informed public discussion about decisions related to surveillance technology and the impact on privacy, the potential of governmental intrusion into people's lives, and the impact such technologies may have on civil rights and civil liberties, including those rights guaranteed by the Ohio and the United States Constitutions, and the First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution, and whereas Village Council finds that legally enforceable safeguards, including transparency, oversight, and accountability measures, must be in place to protect civil liberties and civil rights before surveillance technology is deployed by the Village, and whereas Village Council finds that annual surveillance technology reports should be provided by Village staff to Village Council for the purpose of providing information on the use of such technologies to the public, now therefore Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1. A new chapter 607 entitled Use of Surveillance Technology of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be enacted to read as set forth in Exhibit A, which is attached hereto and incorporated herein. Section 2, this ordinance is hereby authorized under the Village's Home Rule Powers as set forth in Article 1, Section 3 of the Charter of, the Yellow, Springs, of Yellow Springs, Ohio, necessary for the benefit of the health, safety, and welfare of the Village, including the protection of individuals' privacy rights. Section 3, this ordinance shall take effect at the earliest date allowed by law. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. Um, Who is starting this one off? Judith, do you want to? Um, well, I, I think I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs. Um, we got a letter from the American Civil Liberties <coughs> Union of Ohio um, advocating for this piece of legislation, which really Ellis Jacobs, a member of the Justice System Task Force, worked very hard on a couple of other members of the committee um, to bring this legislation to council. Uh, and with the uh, interaction with staff and input from staff as well. Um, so they sent a letter in support of this legislation. Uh, the ACLU of Ohio understands there's various advances in technology, um, carry some benefits and can assist with legitimate law enforcement manners. However, these same advancements uh, occur with such frequent frequency, it remains difficult for anyone, especially the public, to remain informed and engaged the more such scenarios, scenarios grow, the more vulnerable our rights. That is precisely why passage of broad and official protections such as the ones before you today are so vitally important. They, protect, they provide law enforcement and government the ability to acquire and use emerging, emerging technology while providing transparency, accountability, and oversight for the people of Yellow Springs to ensure against its abuse. And in the last paragraph, they note uh, that um, passage of this piece of legislation will ensure the village's role as a statewide and national leader in these matters. Um, we expect the example you would set would motivate others to do the same. Very nice letter from them. I think a, a very positive uh, for this piece of legislation. And Ellis, did you want to, why don't you just give a little intro? I know you're here primarily, or is it going to be you, Chris? Okay. <laughs> Get our own legal counsel up here to talk about this. And Ellis can talk a little bit, answer questions. As an overview to follow up on the comments that you've made, Judith, I, I think that it's, it's really important to put this legislation in a historical context. Um, make no mistake about it, we're going through a, another form of, of technological revolution that's on par with the Industrial Revolution and all those things that we've studied in history. It's just when you live it sometimes you don't realize how significant it is. And when you think about how technology is impacting our lives and how most of us know so little about it, uh, this legislation is designed to take a first step uh, and really lead the way to say we people that live in this country, we have constitutional protections, we have rights, and we want to know affirmatively that those rights are going to be protected in some way. Um, I, I want to thank Ellis and the Justice System Task Force. Um, we went through, uh, Ellis and I went through, along with Jennifer, uh, went through an extensive process with many uh, edits that were designed to tailor this legislation for what the village is. 
uh, with, and how the village operates and functions. If we were in a larger city, this would look a little bit different. The principles would be the same. But fundamentally, what we wanted to do was the, the ordinance focus, focuses on what can be controlled, and people need to understand the distinction. This is about governmental intrusion through technology into the privacy rights of individuals. This is not about individual to individual. We can't control that through traditional ordinances. Those can be criminalized activity, but not in terms of what the government can and can't do vis-a-vis -vis Constitution. So I think people need to understand that part. Then we, what we attempted to do was to create accountability at two levels, because there's two pieces to that. One is, how are you going to pay for this, which is one level of accounting? And then the next is, how are you going to use it, which is another level? So with that in mind, this ordinance structure, uh, and this is a new chapter in the codified ordinances, requires that there has to be a request made to council, which by definition uh, includes sunshine law, notice to, to the citizens to come and have public comment at a hearing. Um, it requires a, a request, what it will be, what the technology will be used for, and then that will lead to a discussion about what the limits on the use of the technology would be. Um, then there will be annual reports on how that technology has been used to make sure that it's being used in the manner that it was presented, uh, and whether or not it makes sense to continue funding the technology if that's what uh, it needs to be done. Um, so I think that it's it was a very collaborative process and frankly I, I, I can't thank Ellis enough because he really took uh, the, the leading um, uh, part of this process. Uh, had at least two or three more conversations with the ACLU and we got feedback from them. Uh, the balance that we had fundamentally came down to we had to make sure that, uh, that we followed the existing framework of Ohio law, that we took into account document retention our document retention policy, that we, we kept that in mind. And then fundamentally, because digital data is just so different, it's not as if I take that piece of paper and I shred it and I know that it's gone. And We have to make sure that we're disposing of that information properly as well. So uh, I, I think that the, the chapter uh, and our ordinances will allow for that discussion in an open and transparent way. Um, and uh, and the key thing here to keep in mind is that the, the chapter, the ordinance is written about the village entities. So it's about the village entities, and it doesn't matter what department it is. So for example, there could be techno surveillance technology that could be piggybacked on something else. I mean, for example, meter reading. Meter reading is technology that could be piggybacked on something else if somebody wanted to do that. We've accounted for that um, by saying that we can do it for our accounting purposes and billing, but nothing else. So I'll stop there and tell us add anything that you may feel that I've left out, which could be substantial. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really good summary, Chris. And uh, hey, thank you for the opportunity to work with Chris. I thought it was a real collaborative um, uh, working relationship. And I think we came up with a product that's really <coughs> good. This ordinance you have in front of you is really the same thing that you looked at several months ago, except we were able to incorporate all of the changes that you wanted to see in there. Patty had a few, the chief had a few. Uh, you wanted to make sure it was perfectly clear that we were just talking about village entities. All of that's been incorporated without fundamentally watering down uh, this particular ordinance. So I think this is, this is really, uh, it's really wonderful that you guys are considering this because it allows us to be proactive and to get ahead of the game on a really fast, in a fast developing area that could, you know, put people at some significant risk. And so what this means, if you pass this, uh, people in Yellow Springs will never be surprised that the, that the police department has adopted surveillance technology without them knowing about it. Any request for surveillance technology will come to you in the form of a proposed use policy. And you'll get to see exactly how they plan on using it, what the possible downsides are, and how they plan on compensating for those downsides, how much it will cost, all that kind of stuff. And you'll get to approve it or not approve it, and if you don't approve it, they can't use it. Uh, if you do approve it, it'll come back to you annually, and you'll get a chance to have a report on how it was used to make sure it's being used in line with how you wanted it used. So I think it's, it's a wonderful policy. It would be a terrific thing for the village to do. Um, if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them, if I can. Do, do you want to answer any current technology that uh, what, the, what this ordinance means about any current technology that the police department's using? 
Well, I mean, there is a section on grandfathering, and it basically says no grandfathering <coughs> except, and the chief asked us to put an exception in there, for instance, for uh, uh, cruiser camps. He really likes them. He wants to make sure they can be used. So the exception in here for cruiser camps says, as long as you're using it the way you're using it now, fine. If you want to start using it differently, you got to come and go through this process. Uh, you know, things that are teed up, and I don't know if the, you know, if the police really want to do this, but a lot of police departments have adopted the, uh, you know, the body cameras, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the chief has looked at it, and he's not that excited about right. it. But we've, it's, yeah, we've talked about it a couple yeah. of times. <clears throat> but, I mean, what you, what you find out is that <clears throat> body cams are only as good as the policy governing how they are used. You know, when do you turn it on? When do you turn it off? Uh, how long do you keep the data, et cetera? What do you do when you gather innocent you know, people doing uncomfortable things, right? I mean, all of these things are absolutely essential in a policy. So if we decide, if the chief wants to adopt body cams, he'll have to fashion a policy that explains, the answer, gives you the answers to all those questions, comes to council, prove it, not approve it, ask for changes so that you will have a say. And more, you know, in some sense, more importantly, the villagers will have a say. Everybody will know about it. It'll be done at a public hearing. The policy will then be posted on the village website so that people can look it up. And if they think it's not being used in an appropriate fashion, they'll know that they can comp complain about it, and you'll have a chance to do a review. So since you brought up grandfathering, do we have any uses currently that will not be grandfathered in that will need that 120-day review? I don't think so. No, according to the chief, not. Yeah. The, when I think about the, the current uses of our surveillance technology, um, utility metering is one that we, we discussed. We have stationary cameras that are used to protect the facilities and the people who are there. Uh, they're not meant to roam or to do anything more than that. Um, but, and then but, the cruiser But cameras. they're not mentioned as an exception. Uh, in another place they, they are. are. Another place. We actually excluded them from the definition yeah. of surveillance technology. Oh. It's in the definition. Yeah. So that was something that somebody did raise. And I think that, that raises a good point that I would address to everybody who's, who's interested in the, in the legislation and wants to read it and understand it. The key is that before questioning whether or not something is subject to this, this ordinance, uh, is read what the definition of surveillance technology is, and that triggers then all of the steps that we get <laughs> to the council. The other thing that I would add is much like the taser policy where we put in language that says it can't be changed, with taser policy can't be changed unless council addresses that and approves it. By definition, because we codify these ordinances, there has to be council improved involvement. The staff cannot unilaterally change something without review and consent. Right. So yeah. related to this particular point, so the exceptions and then the, you know, the cameras in the building are excluded from the definition, do we already have um, use policies for those or do we need to consider whether there needs to be more clarity around that? There, so I know it's not triggered by this ordinance, but... Correct. There, there <coughs> are some things in the general orders manual. We can certainly review those to see if they need to be made more clear okay because you know because that also ties into like retention and everything mm -hmm. so I I mean I think we do have clear policies on that but the ones because there are the three exceptions the cameras are out so I, I'd like us to check on that mm -hmm. I was going to say one of the things I thought at some point uh, PD was using was the license readers and my understanding is they're not really using them now so that's is, is that not correct that's, That's correct. What I understood. Yeah. So that might be a question. Okay. So they're not using those. Surveillance readers would be surveillance technology mm -hmm. that would require the process to yeah. follow it if the ordinance is advanced. Right. So if that would. So then I, sorry, to, I, I have just have two more things and then. Um, can we look at 60702D2F? So this is. Yeah, so this is the, um, this is about the cameras. So I'm wondering, so it says cameras maintained to protect village-owned buildings, parking facilities, and the public and employees while using them. Um, is there a reason why this doesn't, like, say facilities or village property? I'm wondering why it just talks about buildings and parking facilities. Parking. I was going to say, I know at one point there was talk of putting cameras, for example, uh, out water. at the skate park or water at Gaunt treatment. Park, huh? Water treatment plant, I 
Well, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of public, publicly used facilities. Right. And um, so that would include what you're talking about, Brian. And I mean, I personally feel like uh, if we would decide to do that, I mean, that's, that's something that I would want to become, come in front of the public. Um, because that affects the public. It's, it's, well, I guess it does here too, but anyway, I, uh, I know that had been an, a thought in the past that we would do that kind of thing. And, and because there's certain, sometimes when communities decide to do that, they put, they put signs up so you're aware uh, you're being surveilled potentially. Um, so anyway. Okay. Um, go ahead, Ellis. I mean, and I you should come up to the mic yeah. for the... You could certainly say that sidewalks, for instance, and streets are village facilities. So if you said just village facilities, then you could be, and light poles, then you could have cameras anywhere. Okay. And so the, the concern we heard articulated was that we have some cameras up at our village buildings uh, mm -hmm. because we don't want, you know, um, mischief, uh, you know, at the buildings or in the parking lot. And so we tailored it to meet that particular concern. Right. A, a specific concern was the more the facilities that are Remote. remotely located, the water plant, the sewer plant, the Sutton Farm, those things. Yeah. I mean, this building does have cameras, um, but as well, but the other remote facilities were the ones that we were more concerned about because nobody should be there except the crews anyway because of the security of the. And this will allow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I guess that's one thing I, I want us to think about is whether we should change this to facilities or something like that. Um, and we don't necessarily have to work that all out right now. Um, the other thing is uh, 607. But, but Brian, going yeah. back to the, you know, we've got, you know, street lights everywhere. We could have, we could have surveillance everywhere. And so I, I actually, I would be very opposed to that kind of a broad description of of exceptions. <clears throat> well, if we're thinking that it's broad, then I want clarity on what buildings mean. So to me, a water tower is not a building. Um, so we, and I think we do uh, have a reason that we would not want people climbing around our water towers. So I, I think that's an area that could be tightened up a little bit. Okay. Um, would it suffice to have a, a list of each location? I would say that we could define what a building is. Are we, I think we can do it through definitional okay. terms rather than locations, because if we add locations, then we'd have to come back and amend the ordinance. If we change it, add it, or... It's a process. Okay. Um, and then the second thing is uh, 60708. Um, I'm a little bit worried about the language that says... Uh, talks about contracts or agreements, um, or actually right at the beginning, contract or other agreement. So, you know, with some of these requirements that the state's putting us on now, um, do we, I mean, could there be a potential, could we be violating this? If we have to agree, you know, to put up whatever the, I even forget what they're called now. The. Uh, there was significant give and take on this, <laughs> this area. Um, and ultimately, we, we settled on that language uh, because from my perspective, um, I didn't want a, the village to be in a situation where uh, if there was a conflict between the surveillance technology and the contract, that somehow there would be an immediate breach. So we had to have time. We have to have time to transition into that. So uh, I felt that by having the language that says, um, as soon as maybe the contracts may be terminated as soon as legally possible, that would allow for an appropriate termination of whatever that, that contract might be. I'm unaware of any. Okay. Okay. So on, then on the second part. So yeah, I guess I'm thinking like, okay, so, you know, small cell towers are being forced on us. They start to put, you know, surveillance technology in those. I mean, what happens there? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that anybody would know that other than if, the, if a third party did not want to adhere to our chapter, our ordinances in what I'll call village law, then we would have an, a home rule issue that we would determine whether or not that was something that, we, that would be subject to legal challenge. Now, okay. in the context of the many cell towers, as it were, 
Um, that would be an interesting question because if the state has, has, in the same way that gun laws have been controlled by the state, municipalities have limited access or means to control it, we'd have to wait and see what it is. I think it, it's going to be a technology-specific piece and what is the purpose of that surveillance technology uh, and whether or not that offends what the principles are behind this, what this ordinance is. Okay. I that's, mean, that's so a good hypothetically, answer. I would hope that if a third party came in and wanted to use surveillance technology, that they would respect what our code says. They would come to council and say, this is what we're doing. Okay. And then if council said yes, then we don't have a problem. If council says no and they continue to want to do it, then we'll see where that takes us. All right. Would that also Thanks. apply to the county or state that would want to do some sort yes. of? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, Alice and I talked about the, the, the hypothetical of what if there were some um, significant uh, criminal in investigation that involved, uh, I'm not going to use the task force because we're not part of that anymore, but it was a multi-jurisdictional effort because of whatever it was um, and how that could that impact the village. We're just going to have to wait and see how that is on an ad hoc basis. I mean, Alan, Alice, I don't know what you think. I mean, there's, I mean really, there's nothing in here that uh, limits uh, outside uh, law enforcement that has the right to be active in the village from using whatever it is they got. So sure. we're not trying to limit that. It's only, it really only applies if the village decides to acquire some surveillance technology. I mean, that's what this is solely focused on. Um, and so I think. I think we should be good in the various circumstances. That I would agree. And yeah. I'll give you another hypothetical. I mean, l let's, let's say that somehow uh, in the context of some technology that we use, that a third party governmental agency wanted to access our data. And they said, would you <coughs> turn that over? Um, my view would be in the context of that discussion is if you need that for a law enforcement investigative purpose, that's what warrants are for. Mm -hmm. So, again, we have to wait and see what it is, but, you know, we, we just have to, to, to let this evolve sure. and, and see how it plays. Well, I, I'm comfortable with seeing if, you know, it gets challenged, um, but I do think that agreement thing could get tricky. Um, no question. Okay. Other questions or comments? Questions or comments from citizens? Yes, Megan? forget what you're talking about, but the cruiser cam was the other, oh, the surveillance uh, cameras, the cruiser cam was the other thing. I was wondering if we do have a policy on that already. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is just what, if you could just go through what those changes were made between the first ordinance and this one. <laughs> I mean, not just broad strokes. I mean, you mentioned there were specific concerns from certain people. Yeah. Well, as far as the policy on the cruiser cams, that's in the general orders. And if you would like that, just send us an email and we'll get it to you from the police department. Uh, Megan, to answer your question, uh, if from my perspective, um, I, I think that the ordinance is a, pardon me, let's just turn this way, is originally drafted, um, contemplated that, that it, it was broader than just village entities. So I think that that was the starting place. And then once Ellis and I just discussed the language and tailored it for what we thought worked best for the village, fundamentally there was no disagreement. There was, I don't think, there was a significant material change from the beginning of the document to the end. As Ellis said, we captured the concepts, the principles um, that we wanted to capture. And uh, from my perspective, uh, from the solicitor's office's perspective, I'm very, very pleased uh, with the end product. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments from citizens? Okay. If not, then uh, this is a first reading, so this will come back uh, at our next meeting on November 19th, but I would like to go ahead and uh, do a roll call. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Hausch. Yes. All right. Next up we have uh, Ordinance 2018-48. Thanks again, Ellis. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Judy, let's go ahead and read that in full. All right, this is repealing sections 1042.01 I, 1, 2, 3, and 4 of the codified ordinances in the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new sections 1042.01 I, 2, 3, and 4. Change okay. That? It should be I1. You want the whole thing? Uh, just... It's first read. It's your call. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, can I get a motion, please? So moved. 
second. All right. Patty? Okay. So for um, <clears throat> those folks in the village who have installed um, solar or wind generation, which I don't think we have any wind generation, but uh, solar, you, if you produce over the course of the year, uh, as it stands right now, over the course of the year, if you produce more energy than you have used, at the end of the year there is a true up where you are reimbursed for the overage that goes into the grid for the village and you are credited the 11 cents per kilowatt hour plus the power cost adjustment plus the kilowatt hour tax which is an excise tax placed on there by the state. Um, the issue with that is that if we reimburse the the homeowner, this is for residential customers, if we reimburse the homeowner the kilowatt hour tax we essentially are debiting the electric fund twice because we are still required to move that once we sell it to an end user we are required to move that excise tax into the general fund or if it's for someone who has our uh, electricity that lives in the township we have to remit it to the state so if we're moving it from the general fund and giving it to the the homeowner we're and then moving it from or moving it from the electric fund and giving it to the homeowner and then also moving it from the electric fund into the general fund or giving it to the state we're debiting the electric fund twice for that same amount so the recommendation <coughs> of staff along with john courtney and i know this gets very confusing um, is that we continue to reimburse the homeowner for the 11 cents per kilowatt hour and the power cost adjustment, but not the excise tax. And this comes out to be just literally pennies a year, um, less than a dollar in most cases. But it is, it's, it's, it is a thing that it does cause us to debit the electric fund twice. So I thought, and I guess this is why you know, I mentioned reading it in full, but I thought the second whereas was seem very helpful assuming that it's accurate whereas the village of yellow springs is required to pay the tax only on energy delivered and is not required to pay the tax on energy supplied to our grid that's correct so if we, if we as if we as an electric utility deliver it to an end user that's what we have to pay the excise tax on so i mean just reading that this seems yeah. right. pretty logical okay um all right any questions or comments mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh certainly we're in no position to pay taxes twice particularly when it comes to the utility funds so i, I get that and i appreciated the correspondence from um john courtney mm -hmm. and so it helped that you quantified that because i mean it just made me wonder um what is the how many citizens are impacted and how much money by by um, ceasing this tax credit mm -hmm. what's the true impact on the village budget and i think that the bigger question for me as i read this is what behavior does this mo uh, motivate i mean does does it motivate people to move to alternative energy in the village or does it demotivate Right. that behavior so um, the third question maybe is more philosophical but I am interested in the the financial impact yeah and we will be as of the first of the year instead of truing up on an annual basis we are going to be changing the policy and or the procedures that we will be truing up on a monthly basis and then it will become a bit more of an impact um, for the months, the, the summer months when the solar is overproducing. So Impact on citizens or uh, on the on, village? On the village. So about what, how much money are we talking about here? Um, it, it's difficult to quantify it because it changes with every, every producer because everybody has a different amount of solar. For the largest ones in town, I'm going to say probably a couple dollars a month. Um, for the largest residential producers in town. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, what did Johnny say, Colleen? Do you remember how many interconnection agreements he said we had right now? 20 something? Yeah. 
I think I think he said 24 maybe interconnection agreements. So I think what I hear you saying is that you would you would say that taking away a kilowatt hour tax credit would not lead an individual um, household to decide to not put solar on their house. Oh, absolutely, it's just not, not that much impact. It it won't hurt them financially. Absolutely not. It, will, it shouldn't have any impact at all because they still are credited for the, if they overproduce, they're still credited for the 11 cents per kilowatt hour plus the power cost adjustment. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? Okay. So this is a first reading. So this will come back at our next meeting, but um, let's go ahead and get into the roll call. Krieger. Yes. Templin. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Couch. Yes. All right. Uh, moving into resolution 2018-39, um, and I think we should definitely read that in full. Sure. This is approving recommended housing goals for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs recognizes the need for affordable housing units of all types in the village, and whereas Village staff commissioned a housing needs assessment to be performed by Bowen National Research to determine what those needs may be, and whereas Village staff and Council hosted several public meetings to gather in input from residents and other stakeholders to define current housing needs and to determine what goals are reasonable and attainable, and whereas the Village Manager's Housing Advisory Board has met regularly to discuss, research, and analyze information regarding housing needs and attainable housing goals, and whereas the Manager's Housing Advisory Board is now ready to recommend goals to Council for the Village of Yellow Springs as attached in Exhibit A, now, therefore, be it resolved that Section 1, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs does hereby endorse the housing goals as attached in Exhibit A. Section 2, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs does hereby instruct the Manager's uh, Housing Advisory Board to report regularly to Council regarding any actions taken towards achievement of these goals. Okay, can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. Marianne? Yeah. So, for some years, one of the prime goals of the village council has been to uh, look both at to look at affordability and in particular affordable housing we are now in the process of a multi-year housing initiative <coughs> whose goal is to create a housing plan that we will then begin to implement with Nonprofit developers, for profit developers, private landowners, etc. Um, and so it's, we got serious about this when we did the housing uh, needs assessment in 2006, at the end of 2016. There was robust uh, village participation in that process. And uh, a very long document was presented, and which we have, that um, showed what the housing needs are in Yellow Springs. And it gave data on uh, different income levels, different uh, family compositions, uh, different housing needs all across the income spectrum and age spectrum. It also gave some def demographic data in terms of race and um, ethnicity. And the condition of the housing stock and the relationship of rental to home ownership. So for the last over a year, the village manager's housing advisory board has been taking the information from the housing needs assessment to look at, to develop a housing plan. And uh, we have involved uh, Patrick Bowen, who did the housing needs assessment, in helping us look at what kind of goals we should have in terms of meeting the housing needs, not just for people who presently live here, but the projected needs through the next decade or so. So the housing goals that uh, Patrick Bowen suggested are quite detailed. And what we're doing in approving these goals is taking it just a step back and doing the general, uh, general look at the goals and be, it's backed up by the work that he did and that will be an appendix in the plan once the plan gets developed. So I'll read the housing goals. The purpose the purpose of the housing goals is to encourage greater housing choice 
as a strategy to build a diverse community which includes seniors, young adults, and families, and represents persons from various ethnic and racial groups and economic strata. Actively, so the goals are actively support an increase in housing stock over the next 10 to 15 years of 300 to 500 housing units. And I'll, I'll just say this, we're not just talking about affordable housing, we're talking about affordable housing and market rate housing. Two, this stock should ideally be increased by a ratio of 60% rental to 40% purchased units. And we're doing this rent ratio based on Patrick Bowen's data because probably anyone who lives here knows that while we're, we, have, we don't have as much housing as we need, we especially don't have as much rental housing. Three, rental units should be targeted to low and moderate income households with a smaller number targeted to upper income households. And we're saying we understand that subsidies will be needed for very low and low income households. Those are households that make under 80% of the area median income because the market cannot generally serve these needs. Four, purchasable <coughs> units should be targeted to low moderate, and that is 80% to 100% of area median income. Moderate, which would be 100 to 120% of area median income, and upper income. Uh, those are households making over 120% of area median income. Subsidies will be needed for low, moderate, and some moderate income households. These goals are based on the recommendation made by Patrick Bowen of Bowen National Research in his August 20th, 2018 presentation to Village Council. The more detailed Bowen recommendations will be included in the final housing plan, the Yellow Springs housing plan to be completed in early, actually probably will be later, uh, 2019. So where we are in the process is that we have developed and approved the vision. Tonight we will be approving the goals. The next step in the housing process is to develop and approve the strategies that we will be using. And just to clarify, village government is not in the business of developing houses. We, we don't do that. But what we do do is partner with for and nonprofit developers and try to, and uh, planning commission and our village planner has been working very hard to make it easier for homeowners who might wanna divide their property or make a, an accessible dwelling unit to make it easier for people to build more housing units so we're creating greater density in the village and I will stop now. Okay, this is great. Um, I have a couple questions. In the resolution, is it purposeful that the first whereas only says affordable? No, and I just noticed that, and I hadn't noticed it before. I don't think it needs to say that. So we should say just affordable sure. and market rate? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, just you can just cut units. affordable. I, okay. I just missed okay. it. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Um, and then, uh, so did you guys decided to shorten the diversity statement and the purpose okay i just want to make sure that was intentional and my last question is in the fourth bullet um targeting purchable purchasable units at low to moderate and above that's also intentional low moderate i mean so low's not in there i just wanted to make sure that is intentional. Um, okay. It is ex very difficult for households making less than 80% of area median income to buy a house, especially to buy a house in Yellow Springs. And it's very difficult. There is very little subsidy money available to, for home ownership in general. And it just doesn't seem, it seems like it makes more sense to do rental and target rental for that. Okay economic income. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Questions or comments from citizens? Yes, yeah, come up, please, Mitzi. Mitzi Lower. 
Um, I've just got a question with the rentals. Um, renters don't pay um, taxes on property. If it's a, a nonprofit organization that is spearheading it, do the uh, does that organization have to pay the um, property tax, or are they exempt from it? It's my understanding that um, regardless of whether a nonprofit owns a rental building or any building, that that their taxes. Yeah. It, yeah, we, we pay taxes, like if we lease property out and we make money off it, like if we lease a, a field out to a farmer or we lease to, for instance, Stony Creek Garden Center, we have to pay taxes on the money that we receive on those rentals. And so my assumption is that that would be the same for And that would be with the new um, proposed building near the fire station? If, if, if they're rentals and they make money off of them as, as rents and they're not being purchased by the people living there, living there, then my assumption would be yes, they have to pay the tax. They have to pay taxes on the money they receive in rents. So if it was yes. home ink, then they would have to pay the? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. And I see Chris uh, Kennard nodding his head. You're nodding and nodding as coming I was going to say, you know, I know Annie at College is, is doing some housing development. The expectation is they're going to be paying right. taxes, real estate taxes. Uh, the distinction is, at a very simple level is if the, the building is owned by the nonprofit, for example, and the nonprofit is using that building to engage in what the nonprofit does, that's a business purpose of the nonprofit. Right. However, when you're renting to, to third parties, that becomes a, a business, right. which then makes it subject to tax. Good. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, so ultimately the renters are paying property tax through mm -hmm. the owner. Um, any other questions or comments? Excellent. Um, the, so the yes. Only other, right. The only other question or recommendation I had was if, if it made sense to build into this somehow a reevaluation in a period I mean it, certainly it is some going to be a somewhat dynamic <coughs> the goals might not change much but I, I just wondered if it would make sense to say that this will be evaluated um, I don't know how frequently well I would think that would be part of the housing plan itself okay that the whole housing plan would be evaluated including this. on a regular basis and the, so I'm just bringing pieces mm -hmm. uh, and then everything will be put together and, and yeah it'll be a living document mm -hmm. and it will have to be reevaluated I don't know how frequently. Mm -hmm. Thanks Mary. Yeah. Okay so I'd like to make a motion to oh Lauren. My name is Lauren Miller. Just occurred to me that we're we are ignoring the rehabilitation of houses that are coming apart. And I'm wondering if that's anything that's been discussed. Yes, um, that has been discussed. Uh, when we say 300 to 500 housing units, mm -hmm. that could also include houses that would be rehabbed. Oh, okay. So it's not necessarily new. Now, I will say that unfortunately, it's much easier to get money and build new than it is to develop rehab programs. Mm -hmm. But it does. But that should be part of it. Would it make sense to clarify that? And because I certainly didn't get that impression at all when you read the, well, the goals. Well, the next stage of this will be the strategies, and that is one strategy. Okay. Just like well, there are be a lot well, of strategies. Infill, so I mean partnerships. I mean all that's part of it. <clears throat> programs perhaps that would encourage people you know the village itself has limited capacity and within the village the only ha housing organization that we have home Inc green mat um, we have to tailor whatever strategies we have to what capacity we mm -hmm. have so it would be it would be great if we can have a rehab program Mm -hmm. Whether that's something that'll end up in the final housing strategies, I, I can't say at this mm -hmm. point. The, the, to piggyback on a comment that Lisa made about 
uh, the review process. We're, we're working on data that's already over two years old. And just like we've, we've had a housing crisis at one point that was mm, predictable, unpredictable, I mean, that's debatable. You know, we don't know what will happen next year or whenever. Yeah. And so it does seem important to take a look at that, to maybe build that piece in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thanks. Well, you know, that said, can I just correct? Marianne had said but you had noted the Bowen study was completed in 2016. It was, in fact, 2017. Yeah, that's so what I was thinking. And, and it projected five years out. Right. Okay. Dan? Dan, Dan Kerrigan. Um, so how many other um, towns or villages in this area or across Ohio that have this kind of ordinance for um, recommended housing goals? I'm just kind of... I know in bigger cities, they might have. Well, it's a resolution. It's a resolution, but it's a resolution. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you're. I think the here. most, the, the kind of uh, smaller towns that might do this are towns that that are similar to Yellow Springs yeah. in that we are destination community. Our housing costs are, are significantly higher than the region, and those kind of towns. I believe there are those kind of towns. I don't know exactly but, who they yeah. are. Um, who are looking at their housing because they're having some of the same problems we're having. And so, uh, but so, the government has always been involved in housing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a significant housing policy. You know, we all benefit, whoever owns a home benefits from housing policy because you get to take a tax write off uh, for your, you know, if you own a home uh, for your mortgage costs. Um, so, anyway, housing, you know, we're doing this because of the kind of you know, the changes in our community that our community has told us, many of the members of our community have told us, you know, they want <coughs> ordinary people who work and serve the community and work in the community to have an opportunity to be able to also live here. And so that's, you know, we're, we're responding to a very uh, strong uh, sense of need in the community. So this is not driven by, or this um, housing goals are not, driven by any other model. You're just saying it's driven by the well, needs in this town. You're not looking at other places that well, have we have some. looked at other have, places. When we first um, decided to really get serious about housing, uh, we did look at other communities all across the country and what they have done. So it's most of the other small towns are, are as uh, Judith said, destination communities in Colorado, on the East Coast, and in Colorado, places like that. In Ohio, it's only bigger cities, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, I'm not sure about Dayton, who have housing programs okay. and housing goals, as far as I know. Thank you. But I should say, I mean, every time you listen to NPR and a story about, you know, housing crises, which are in every municipality, every tactic and strategy that we've thought about they talk about, mm -hmm. big or small. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're not reinventing anything. Right, and I did attend a, <coughs> an affordable housing session at the ICMA conference that hit on some of the things and also brought some new ideas that Mary Ann and I discussed one day last week. That's so. the International City Managers. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I I'll just say, housing in this country is in crisis. It's not just Yellow Springs. Now, there are some communities like Springfield for example, that have huge areas that are disinvested, Dayton, where you can go in and buy a house for ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, which of course you could never build. But uh, so either communities have huge areas of disinvestment, Rust Belt, Detroit, Youngstown, Cleveland, or you have places like Yellow Springs or other desirable places where it's very hard for for even an upper income person to move in, let alone lower income person. Sure. And so maybe one more comment, because I, I don't get the impression that we're going to be changing the substance here, but I do want to remind everybody that council reviews goals every year. That's part of our process. And so, so we would certainly look back at this document to make sure it was still up to date and relevant. Uh, so with that, I'd like to make a motion to um, uh, approve the resolution with the removal of affordable in the first whereas. Can I get a second? Second. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Great. 
We have one more piece of legislation, which is resolution 2018-40. And this is actually my favorite annual resolution. And I always love to hear it read in full, please, Judy. Indeed. This is approving the annual distribution of flour and sugar to village widows and widowers. Whereas Wheeling Gaunt, who was born into slavery in about 1815, did through his own wit and will purchase his own freedom as well as that of his wife and a friend, and did thereafter make his way to Yellow Springs, Ohio in the early 1860s, where he became a successful and respected member of the village. And whereas Mr. Gaunt at his passing in 1894 left in his will a bequest that the poor worthy widows of Yellow Springs, regardless of their race, be given 25 pounds of flour during the Christmas season. This purchase to be made from the sale of crops grown on what is now Gaunt Park. And whereas residents of Yellow Springs to this day enjoy the benefits of Gaunt Park as a result of the generosity of Wheeling Gaunt, and whereas as a nod to the changing times, Mr. Gaunt's bequest has over the years been amended to offer five pounds of flour and five pounds of sugar to both widows and widowers, all of whom are considered worthy. And whereas as the holiday season approaches and we think of ways we can share our love and concern for all members of this community, it is fitting that we honor the memory of Wheeling Gaunt and the spirit of his gift in the manner he intended. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to procure the traditional supplies and distribute them as stipulated in the deed for Gaunt Park and as expanded by Council in 2012. Section 2, the expenditure of up to $3,000 from the Widows Fund number 902-1703-54102 is hereby authorized as provided in the village's annual appropriations. Okay, thank you. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. Um, well, I, I can't imagine that there's any questions or comments, except that this is amazing and a great tradition. But I will emphasize that if you do know of widow or widowers that may not be on our radar, please Ruth Ann. let Ruth Ann know. And you can call us at uh, 7202. Uh, and that's number four. Right? Well, her direct line is 3402. 3402. That one I know. Cool. Um, all right. All one, those in favor? Yes, one clarifying please. question. Um, so I uh, just want to confirm that this would cover anyone who identifies as a widow or widower, regardless of the, the, their gender or the nature mm -hmm. of their relationship, mm -hmm. same sex, <coughs> but it's not just for male, female, widow, widower I, situations. I have never read the original provision. Um, I would assume that it would apply, Judy, would be? Uh, absolutely, <coughs> except that you have to have been married. I mean, that is the stipulation. So gender is not identified, mm -hmm. but it, you have to have been married. Yes. And there was a time when you know, we did expand it to, you know, widowers or let's say to everybody mm -hmm. at one point in the past. So. OK, just wanted to confirm that. Yeah. Thank okay. you. OK, great. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. We are now at citizen concerns. This is the time on the agenda. <laughs> yes. Uh, when uh, we entertain, uh, we'd love to hear comments from citizens about topics that are not on the agenda. And we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. And so, um, Pat, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, my two folks that signed up and then, okay. And you're next. Yeah, okay. and it's okay that you didn't sign up. <laughs> um, okay, so if I can read, actually, I can't. I can't read this first name. So who was my first person that signed up? Was it Lori? Oh, yeah, it is Lori. Okay, I, I saw an L, but uh, yeah, Lori, come on up. <laughs> you have a very uh, elegant script. <laughs> Thank you. So. I'm here to clarify, I was here uh, about a month ago when you redid the ordinance about RVs and um, cars being parked on the street and people living from the RVs. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And so I know that you said in 30 days that it would go into effect. But I'm here uh, at request of the police officers that I've talked to because once again, there's vans and people living at the end of North College and the police are under the impression that there's nothing they can do because it's not in the amendment that it's a, a conversion van or a car. It has to specifically be an RV. And that was not my impression. So I'm trying not to be Miss Kravitz and call them every day. But I'm really, I, I'm truly concerned for safety and health matters. That is, I do not mean to demonize anyone, but it, 
I'm a person who is tidy and I, it concerns me that it's unhealthy. And so I'm trying to find out what I can expect the police to do and what they're saying is because it's not an RV that the van can move from this side of the street to the other side of the street and that's the way the ordinance is written because it's not an RV. And that was not the way I understood it. The, the, way, the, the way the ordinance was written, it was specifically RVs and mobile homes. Uh, it did not address conversion vans and, and the like and because the, the complaints that we had had were about RVs and mobile homes and we, that's why we moved them into the jurisdiction of the police department. So what do I need to do? Well, <clears throat> is, what's the problem with it? With someone the, who maybe is homeless living in their van? Is that the, it's that's that they're living on? on the street and I don't think it's safe and I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I don't think it's healthy. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't pay $4,000 worth of taxes to walk down the street and find people living out of a van. A van. That's just that's not healthy. I, I gave all my reasons before. I don't feel like I need to do that. Again. I, I, I wasn't here to, at that meeting. I think. Okay. It's just if we want to do a Yellow Springs campground, I am glad to support that. I'm a therapist myself. I work with the disenfranchised, but I don't think it's healthy having people living out of cars or vans or pickups or anything where there's not running water, sewerage, and appropriate care for people living together in a community. I walk by it every day. And it truly concerns me for health reasons and also safety. The man who built the pipe bombs was living in his van. I would like to know who my neighbors are when I pay taxes. It's that simple. I don't mind walking by a house that's not cared for if I know who people are and where they come from. And they have plumbing. And they have water. It's, I just need to know what to do. Because I do. I feel like Ms. Kravitz, every time I call, it's a different story. So do I need to, do I need to talk to the zoning manager again? And it would be about an R, it's just about a conversion van at this part point? I, I think council, I think we should hear your concern and, you know, council should consider if they want to make, take a next step or not. So we're not, a, I don't think we're, we're averse to expanding the definition of, you know, so that we cover all of the options. You know, a vehicle meant to be driven is not meant to be lived in. I mean, we, we can certainly, we can amend the legislation. It, it, we just need to know what council would like to, be, to do. I agree with Judith that it is a discussion at this point for. Okay, and so I, I'd like to have it put on an agenda and not get into the discussion. Now. Yeah, we're definitely not going to get into the discussion now. So, um, all right, so thank you, Lori. And uh, I mean, it's, it's good to know that. Thanks for pointing out the. Yep. And we will, when we talk about agenda planning, discuss uh, adding this to a future agenda. So. Um, I thought that's what was done. That's where I'm confused, but I'll figure it out. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, what you're hearing is that maybe at least some council members also thought that this ordinance would take care of that. And if it's not, then we need to have a discussion about it. Um, so, um, thank you. Uh, okay, Lauren Miller, have you on next? Hi, my name is Lauren Miller. I've just got a couple of things. I spent some time watching the um, uh, council meeting uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, and so I had some com comments after that. Um, I, I wanted to ask that you all as council members not uh, predict your vote prior to a discussion um, in terms of um, uh, making a statement about your intentions of how you're going to vote. Um, because for me, as a, a taxpayer, it causes me to feel like, like a decision has already been made, um, or a person is committed to a certain way of thinking, and that they don't have openness to hearing from um, community members or other information that you all might um, you know, come up with from experts or whomever. Um, and the second thing I'd like to just talk about is um, something that's really been bothering me um, through the years, and that is that sometimes we make, I think council, this village, makes a decision, and it feels like either conditions in the world or in our little village change, and the long-term effects of a decision that is made here at council come back to kind of haunt us. For instance, um, what I'm particularly thinking about is, is um, our desire to keep the size of the village 
in village size as opposed to a town or city or something like that. And so we do have a, a limit of our city um, size, I mean physical size of the village. Um, and the numbers that that size can uh, easily handle. 5,000, I think, is that the number? Uh, That's, five, yeah. Right. And so also by doing that, we've also limited the potential for available sites for um, projects that have um, worth to them. And I'm thinking in particular um, the 54-unit uh, property. And so by saying that there's an easement on um, the Jacoby, for instance, area, that um, we can't develop those areas, we've, we've limited that as a, an area of growth. We are, are closing down our spaces to grow. And I know, I understand, although I don't agree with the infill um, position that this village has, um, I, I think we're causing problems for ourselves in other ways, you know, to put an, uh, and I'll discuss that at another time about um, the uh, PUD uh, hearing. But I, I think I'm, I'm just asking everybody to look at really long-term effects of decisions. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Pat Deweese. Pat Deweese. Um, I'm part of the Yellow Springs Friends Meeting, and our um, Quaker meeting is um, in conversation with other faith uh, groups here in town because of a shared concern about the increased uh, action of the immigration and customs enforcement activity in the state of Ohio and very close to us all around us, Cincinnati, Columbus, and so on. Um, so we have already um, hosted some meetings, some educational meetings, and we're you know, coming together to talk about how we can actually be an interfaith um, advocacy and support network. That's our goal for the future. And what I'm here for tonight is to ask, invite the council to revisit your welcoming community of opportunity statement in the context of this concern. And this statement, this resolution, which was um, passed in 2017, is really quite powerful, and I certainly commend the council for putting attention into it. The three things we think might make it stronger and would speak to the current condition would be, um, first of all, in the list of people who are affirmed, um, we are welcoming people regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We would like to see you add, um, and regardless of immigration status. I mean, you can assume that that's in the list of this long list of all humans, but we're right now in a condition where not everyone agrees that immigrants fall into the universe of all people mm -hmm. and all community members. Um, so, and they themselves, of course, immigrants living with a lot of fear right now might not see this, that, that they're included. They might not conclude that they're included. The second thing we'd like to see is we'd like some sp very specific language in this statement that directs the police department that they will not enforce federal immigration laws that target immigrants. Um, and they will cooperate with ICE immigration customs enforcement only in cases involving serious crimes. Now that policy is pretty widespread around the country and even here in Ohio because local law enforcement absolutely does not uh, need any more work. <laughs> they have enough, enough to do and it is the question of the legality of them actually doing federal <coughs> immigration work. So we would like to see that language that our police department will not enforce federal immigration laws that target immigrants and will not cooperate with ICE except for serious crimes. And then the last thing that we'd like to see in this welcoming, in, in addition to the welcoming statement, is that um, we actually adopt the name Sanctuary, Sanctuary Village. It's a, it's a loaded, heavy, and powerful word, uh, and we feel that um, there is actually no legal definition of sanctuary, and we are aware that the Trump administration has threatened 
towns, villages that take that name. However, that hasn't stopped the entire state of California, the entire <laughs> state of Illinois, and the entire state of New York from calling themselves sanctuary states. And last time I looked it up, there were about 600 um, towns nationally that called themselves sanctuary cities. Here in Ohio, Columbus, Dayton, Lake County, Lima, Lorraine, Luck Oberlin, Painesville, and Cincinnati have taken that term of, Cincinnati, of sanctuary. And I think with all of the harsh immigration enforcement and the, I think uh, our awareness, the sort of moral imperative to stop these um, tearing families apart, damaging businesses, heightening fears, encouraging violence, that we feel, certainly the Interfaith Network feels a sort of moral imperative to use this word, which has a sort of sacred connotation. We will create a safe place. We will protect you. We will stand with you. So those are the three things that we would like to see added to the welcoming statement. All right. Thanks, Pat. OK. okay. And I would like to bring back a revised uh, resolution. OK. And yeah, so we'll talk our, about that at an a, agenda. At a future meeting. Yep. Sounds good. Um, Athena? I came in to talk about two issues, but I, I want to address this, and, and I don't want to keep doing dueling battles, so if you'd like to talk with me outside, we can at another time. You cannot criminalize the homeless. Please do not even entertain the idea of adding cars and RVs to criminalize the homeless. Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, and places around the nation attempt to criminalize the homeless, and they fail in a lot of ways. This personally affects me, but it also affects a lot of other people. If we believe in human rights, if we believe in not dehumanizing people, you cannot make it a criminal issue for the police to respond for the homeless. I will fight this to the nail. I'm tired. I have a lot of stuff that's going on, so I may have to try to mobilize people. But you guys at a fundamental level should go, oh, we cannot and should not criminalize the homeless. I don't know how much time I have left. My second issue is the cost of public records. DVDs have gone from $2 to $5. I did an estimation, and at most, if you are getting taken for a ride, your DVDs should cost no more than $1 for you guys. I have been given DVDs where multiple data, or told I can expend an exorbitant amount of money, where multiple data is broken up against DVDs. And I've done the math where you can fit a whole bunch of data on one DVD or one CD-ROM, which means I'm getting charged $5 for a single DVD, $10 for two of them, $15 or $20, that's absurd. That is making it very difficult for the public to get public records. As my understanding of the ORC, you're not allowed to charge more than it actually, the medium that you put it on. This is exorbitant, it needs to come back down, and you guys owe me some money, and you owe some other people some money. That's my second issue. My third issue is thank you for the ta taser data. I looked at the data, I looked at the report, I watched the video. Your sergeant did not accurately represent how many times she tased a human being. Your sergeant should know better, and you should expect your sergeant to be able to know better. I don't know how many times we can tell you guys your sergeants are a problem. When you look at the taser data, and I recommend you all do it, I can forward it to you all tonight, you will see that he was tased back to back to back. I recommend that you look at national taser standards and you look at your own taser policy. <coughs> your sergeant, in my estimation, maybe I'm wrong, I'm, I need some more sleep to really dig into it to be sure, I believe violated a lot of issues here. I looked at the videos from Officer Meister, I have those, I'll be putting those up publicly. I am horrified at what has been done to Officer Meister based on the videos I've watched and what has not been done to Officer Penrod Watson based on the video I watched. And your chief who said, hey, go ahead and tase this guy. So there's my three comments. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Athena. Uh, any other citizen concerns? All right, thank you very much. Um, we are going to <coughs> move into special reports, and um, I believe we're going to turn things over to Colleen.
Um, I guess I also, at this point, we need to make a decision maybe. We're 20 minutes over our uh, agenda. And um, we had said at our Wednesday meeting that we might talk about other general fund issues. That was not on the agenda. We could stick just to enterprise and special revenue um, and uh, rather than extend the conversations. I don't know how council members feel. I, I feel like, um, no, I feel like there are some specific uh, decisions that need to be made that I personally would like to be a part of it. I know I'm coming off at the end of the month because I think it will be hard for any new person to, you know, be, this is, you know, our, our uh, budgets are pretty complex and it's a big decision making and a very important one. Um, so I would like us to at least note if we don't feel we can vote on it tonight, but I feel like we, we've already talked about these issues, haven't we, publicly? And I think we should at least decide to bring legis, uh, you know, to put, I mean, we're going to have another vote, correct, on the general fund on those, we're in those specifics. On anything, I don't imagine that we're voting on anything tonight. Well, but those specific ideas of adding in uh, certain uh, added inf uh, funding for this or that or taking out this or that. Okay, Let, let's see how it goes. I, Why don't I would, we see how it goes? I, I mean, would I, suggest that then we try to get those out there, but, you know, dedicate more time at the next I, meeting. I guess I would, whether, I, I don't particularly want to go to 11 o'clock tonight, but I do think that it's important that we make the budget decisions while Judith is still on council rather than bring in a new council member partway through the budget. Okay. All right, Colleen. Okay, so we're gonna start with the enterprise fund. And since we already had a, a nice, almost four hour workshop to go over, I would entertain your questions when we're done with each of the enterprise funds. Um, so we'll start with the electric fund. And I'm just gonna go into, um, I won't do every line item, but the um, estimated revenue, again, $4,447,700 stayed the same. And we're going to the expenditures. We'll start with the very top, which is wages. These really printed small, didn't it? Yeah. My computers mm -hmm. got a lot bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so personnel services, the total there, which includes all the wages and all the um, benefits that go with it is $491,650. General operating expenditures, which is training and travel, is at 5000 The total under contractual service is $3,758,050. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I'm losing you. Okay. I, got, I got the, the revenue part and the um, professional services, but can you Oh, contractual services, was that the next one? It's general operating expenditures. The training and travel would be after the personnel services. Oh, okay, it's on They're a little bit bolder. There, there'll be totals for. Yeah, it's uh, on the next page, okay. Okay, and that was 5,000. Yeah. So that was general operating. So contractual services, all of those line items will come to $3,758,050. The total under material and supplies is 57000 Capital, 183000 uh, No debt service. Miscellaneous, 8000 And transfers of 50000 So the total expenditures I have under the electric is $4,552,700. It did reduce that by thirteen thousand four hundred dollars from the last time we, when we had our workshop, I was able to keep looking. Now every line item I compare with history, like you have on your copies, uh, what we spent in 2015, 16, 17, and then I go to date on every line item to see where we're at versus what we budgeted for 18 and where we are right now in 18 to help predict in 19. 
And so, so the deficit on that is 105. 105, and out of that, 183,000 included in that total is the capital projects. So if they were no capital projects, we would not be dipping into the reserve. But there's right. quite a bit of the capital that we talked about. So with all the capital of 183,000, we'll be dipping into the reserve 105. And can you mention again what you said last Wednesday about um, based on our sort of standard, um, how much should be in that fund? In the reserve, what what I use is a four-month expenditure reserve. So in to try to hold in our in our fund balance. So for a four-month reserve in the electric fund, I have that at one million five hundred and fifty-eight thousand. But I'm estimating our ending balance to be 2652 So we're well above the reserve, and that includes a lot of capital catch-up projects. The electric fund's very healthy. Okay. I have a question, I guess, really for Patty. Um, first, I really appreciate all the work staff has done on making a plan for capital improvements and educating council. And it seems like in the electric fund, there's enough money that all this work but I also just want to be assured that when staff has made these plans that they feel they have the capacity to do that work I mean because I know everyone is feeling stressed about how much is being done right and, and some of some of the capital projects are are going to be in-house where we're providing the labor and, and as well as the materials um, and those things will be planned out you know Johnny mm -hmm. kind of has them mm -hmm. planned out other things will be done by contractors, and we've tried to get prices from the contractors to include in the budgets. And it could be for various reasons. It could be a, it, it, that it's we don't have the time, and it's it's an, an extremely important and urgent repair. Or it could be something that we don't necessarily have the the equipment to do, such as some of the the uh, the three phase um, the three phase lines where we've replaced poles that have three phase lines on them and. You have to have certain equipment to do that safely that we don't have. So we contract certain poles out. So yes, I appreciate, Mary Ann, that you want to make sure that staff has the capacity to complete those in the year that we're budgeting for them. And that has been taken into consideration. Okay. Any other questions on the electric? So what did you say the, the final two minutes? The ending balance, balance. in the fund yeah. is going to be estimated at 2652000 if we spent everything in that proposed budget and did every capital project. And what's the four-month out amount? Uh, $1,558 <laughs> is, is, is the minimum, not to go below, but we'll be at $2.6 million. Two point six million is my estimated ending balance in electric. Hmm. Are is the the ending balance? Is it on this page? And I'm just not no. seeing it. It's going to be on the very front page. Of oh, it's the on the front page. Sorry. Enterprise. Mm -hmm. They're broken down the very top, and I'll run through yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. That two, there, I see it. Two million seven fifty-seven five fifty-nine. <coughs> that very first one is what I'm estimating our beginning balance to be in 2019, January 1. And then our revenue, estimating at 4,447,700. Estimated expenditures at 4,552,000, which means we're gonna be using 105,000 more than what we're anticipating to get in. And that puts an ending balance in the fund at 2,652,000. Um, I have another question. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Um, my brain just... Um, I think, one, that this uh, budget does not include an increase for consumers this year, as yes. we had talked about. Is that correct? No, it's, it's in there. It, the, Whatever was it's already pre-approved. It's the $1 dollar yeah, revenue. Yeah, but I just, we had been planning on stepping it up, hadn't we? Not on the electric. Oh. Electric was just the dollar, the dollar a month oh, okay. readiness for um, service. Was there any consideration of lowering the electric? I I I I would not, and we I actually talked to John Courtney about this a little bit, um, because 
we have not done the increases for so many years and we played catch up unfortunately which which was difficult for everyone but just because we're accomplishing some of our capital projects in 19 doesn't mean that we're not going to have continuing uh -huh. capital projects so you know at this point with if if council chooses to revisit the increases it will have an adverse effect on the infrastructure that we have projected out for the next seven years so if i can add to that though i think a more direct answer to your question marianne is yes there have been discussions about the electric fund and whether there is a possibility to not increase next year i think is when it's scheduled to go up again is that true january. in january uh -huh. um next year being 2020 um, and if there's a way to um, somehow give relief for our, our electric utility costs. And um, I mean, this is something we've been talking about off and on quite a bit in the finance subcommittee. And for me, I, and I, I understand that there's this important balance between having enough money in these reserves and, but when I hear that there is such a difference in the reserves from what's needed for a four month run out versus what's in there. And I totally understand that there, this isn't just one year in isolation and that next year there's a lot of capital expenses again. But I still feel like we need to keep pushing a little bit on having that much in the reserve. I think those kind of discussions we should hold till the end of this discussion. I mean, because that's. You know, I think we should get the whole presentation yeah. and yeah. then because there's also this idea that potentially some of the ca the capital projects, monies that are coming out of the general fund, you know, that we could really look to the electric fund. I mean, I know Brian's got this idea. You know, I'd rather we, I think it doesn't make sense to get into this conversation until we're all done. Well, but since the question was asked, I, no, no, I no, felt no, like no, I wanted to answer that. I'm just, saying, I'm that, just Judith. suggesting and, that we all, and I'm just I'm suggesting just, that we all kind of hold on. And I did want to put an answer back. This fund is trying to grow, um, and Johnny can explain a little bit more, and he's in, um, giving this information to me. There is a buyout Ooh. that has to come in a few years, and it's going to be very expensive. So just because the money is growing in there and we're getting our infrastructure needs done mm -hmm. and we're getting repairs done, and it's a very minimal increase to go back and decrease we, we still need to look at the bigger picture on what that dollar amount needs to be at, at that buyout. Well, the, the two major things are the third circuit, which we're trying to get the engineering done for in 19 to move forward in 2020. But the other, what you're talking about is the buyout, buyout of the solar field so that we don't have to pay AEP for the generation. Then if the field is ours, then the generation is ours. Mm -hmm. So that's, we can that buy it out any time? On. We can buy it out at year. I think it begins at year eight or ten in the and then at certain it's it's at certain intervals through the life of the contract right well I do think you know an overall theme that we should be thinking about here is right sizing our funds and if we are not going to do some kind of relief because we definitely have a capital project coming then this should go into a capital fund it shouldn't just sit there. I mean, we, we should be very clear about what we're doing over the next five years. This buyout thing, that sounds a bit in the future. And I think we have to remember that these funds don't just stay static, right? They, I mean, mm -hmm. they will grow. So we've got to try to think about how we can match the two. Okay. All right, so let's go to the water fund. And I'll just read the uh, estimated revenue in the water fund as a total at four million four hundred. Oh, electric. Sorry, wrong yep. page. On the water fund, total revenue is one million one hundred ninety thousand. And then going through the same um, just se sections, the expenditures in the water fund, water distribution, personnel services is three hundred and ten thousand. Training and travel is 3,000. Contractual services, 75,000. Materials and supplies, 45,000. 
Capital is eighty six thousand five hundred. Debt service is fifty two thousand forty seven dollars. Miscellaneous is twenty five hundred. Transfers are twenty five thousand. Total water distribution expenditures would be five hundred ninety nine thousand forty seven dollars. Is this getting too detailed or not enough? This no, okay. okay. I'm gonna keep it. Personnel services for the water treatment fund is two hundred six thousand two hundred. Training and travel is fifteen hundred. Contractual services eighty seven thousand. Materials and supplies seventy six thousand fifty dollars. Capital twenty five thousand. Debt service two hundred sixty thousand and six dollars. That does include a full year of our new water treatment plant. Miscellaneous is twenty. Miscellaneous is nothing. Transfers are twenty five thousand. Water treatment total expenditures is $680,756 for total expenditures in the water fund, $1,279,803. I had reduced 12,000 of the expenditures after our meeting last Wednesday. Any questions on the water fund? Yeah, do we have uh, a new person in the water? I mean, there's a pretty big increase both in wages and what I was noticing was health insurance, but. Um, they do have a new person that they're splitting between the water and the sewer um, due to some new EPA regulations on the amount of time that somebody has to be at the plant and they've been shorthanded so there is an increased person. The health insurance is across the board in the budget for family for everyone and again our actuals will be lower but we've put in just in case everybody had to have a family plan we have the money appropriated for that mm -hmm. expenditure mm -hmm. so these will not be the numbers we will hit these are my considered not to exceed budget amounts and I'm gonna work real hard to get these numbers and, down as we go through and Marianne I want to be clear when you say a new person and she says a new person I think you're talking two different things you're asking did we hire an additional person and the answer to that is no because if you remember John Christensen is leaving to move to Seattle and yesterday was his last day so <clears throat> yes we have a new employee Kevin Baker who has was one of our seasonal employees who got his license while he was here and is working towards his other license um, so we have a new employee but it's not an additional employee in the sense that John is leaving and Kevin is taking his place but I mean the water treatment wages have increased by what about 30,000 there has also been some adjustments on how we prorate, um, especially management. Some of them were not spread out. We did a really detailed um, payroll. Some might go up, some <coughs> might go down to put every employee into the correct fund that they're being expensed out of and then prorating the managers into portions of this to spread out. So it will be different than last year, a slight difference but we just put everybody exactly where they need to be. And a clarifying question, is there a 5% added to these four. wages? 4%. Four. Four 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 so is that's reflected I, in these spreadsheets. Yes, yeah. and I had 10. Very tiny print. <laughs> Thank and, you. And we had our workshop. Oh, I see it. It's four. Thank you. I wanted five. I did too. <laughs> I actually wanted 10. <laughs> but specifically on water treatment, the note does say that there's, I guess, a half salary for? I, I had put in for a new one that Johnny had requested. Okay. Um, because of, and again, we can, I can get a little more detail from him, but there were, um, the way it was explained to me with the new EPA rules, um, basically there was only two licensed people and one of them is Brad and he was not able to take vacation time. So there, we put in the budget for a new licensed operator that can operate the water treatment plant and the sewer plant. Right now Brad's the only, with, with John's departure right now Brad's the only one that holds a dual license. And they've been shorthanded with the new responsibilities at the plant so they asked to put one in so that is a new employee. So we, we do have, everybody needs to be cross trained and have licenses for both plants. Right now Brad is the only one that has dual licenses. Mm -hmm. Any other water? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 
No, no, no. Oh, okay. How is the is the sewer fund part of the water? No. No, it's separate. It'll be separate. So, so there's a ninety thousand dollar deficit, basically. Is that reserve still? At the end of um, yeah, for the to do the capital projects, and I'll go back to my cover sheet. So the water fund has an estimated beginning balance of eight hundred thirty thousand one hundred ninety one dollars. Revenue is estimated to come in at one million one hundred ninety thousand, and expenditures at one million two hundred seventy nine thousand, for a um, uh, using the reserve of eighty nine thousand eight hundred three dollars, of which one hundred eleven thousand is capital again. But I mean, is the amount in the fund? Still Our reserve should right be here. at four hundred thirty three thousand, and I'm estimating it at seven hundred forty, almost double. See, it's over here. From 433, yeah, we'll have 740 in the fund. So it's almost double. As the estimated reserve, the lowest reserve. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go to sewer. Do the same thing. Sewer revenue is estimated at 1207000 and on the expenditures for the sewer collection personnel, $273,950. Training and travel is $2,000. Contractual services, $74,950. Quite a reduction. Um, we talked lightly at our workshop. Some of the expenditures for um, the, um, well, no, the pro professional services in this line item came down last year or this year, 2018, they had a lot of extra work with new buildings and I, I don't have all yeah. the history, but I can get more. So the contractual service is 74,950. Under the materials and supplies is 24,500. Capital, 187,750. No debt service, miscellaneous is 6000 and transfers at 25 Sewer so collection total expenditures, estimating $594,150. Sewer so treatment, the other half of the sewer fund. Personnel services are $206,700. Training and travel is $3,100. Contractual services, $257,950. Materials and supplies, 35450 Capital is 75000 Debt service is $76,978. Transfers out, 25000 For a total of the sewer treatment, $680,178. I reduced 14000 out of that. Total for both, for the sewer fund, one million two hundred seventy four thousand three hundred twenty eight dollars of expenditures but I'll go over beginning fund balance should be at eight hundred twenty one thousand eight dollars revenue is one million two hundred seven thousand expenditures is one million two hundred seventy four thousand three hundred twenty eight dollars to be in the reserve sixty seven thousand three hundred twenty eight dollars we are getting capital improvement at two hundred sixty two thousand quite a lot of projects in that fund. The reserve should be a minimum of 448000 I'm estimating the ending balance at $753,680. There questions on this, sewer? And then solid waste would be the last one. Solid waste is our trash. Estimated revenue, $282,500. And expenditures two hundred and eighty thousand three hundred dollars. So we'll be um, actually two thousand two hundred dollars over our expenditures. We tried to just keep that one balanced. We just charge basically what we what our expenditures are. That is the enterprise funds. I get, uh, thank you very much. Um, I was going to say I just wanted to because this can be complicated for citizens to say our funds are in good shape. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, a standard is three months worth of costs that you have that much in reserves. 
our standard is four months because we're conservative about it. <laughs> uh, but in fact, our funding, and it's, we do have um, a lot of capital improvements that we need to do in the next few years. So, it's, so this money's sitting there for a purpose. Um, not saying council may not want to consider this, what, what this right size is. I think that's, that's a good thing to do. But, um, but most of them are almost double the four month. So I'm saying that right, correct? Okay. So, um, so our funds are, are healthy, basically. Uh, so anyway. And what I'm looking at, because we do have a lot of the capital projects, yeah. is trying to make sure that our still our revenue and our expenditures are balanced. If I take out the amount that we're mm -hmm. short, but it reflects the capital, but we're still coming in if we didn't have it, mm -hmm. I would say our revenue is in line with our expenditures. Oh, okay. yeah. So the only one that's actually, at this point, that's staying neutral is the trash. Everything else mm -hmm. is good. They're balanced. They're, they're well. And we have enough reserve to, to tackle the projects that Johnny and his crew have been asking for. So again, not all of them are going to get done. We're probably going to run out of time. Hopefully they come under budget. I know that the budget will be watched carefully and we will stay under. This is my not to exceed. This is where I hope I don't have to come back and, and ask for more money yeah. on the supplementals Thank and you. show you what we can save. Okay, so we're done with enterprise funds. We want to go on to the next one real quick. I heard somebody snoring Snow behind me here. I was just, just, just going to blame it on Dave Turner back there. <laughs> I try to get it more exciting. Okay, oh, special revenue funds. Ooh. They'll start with the 200 numbers. Just let me know when you're there. Where is it at relative to everything else? I don't think it's, in um, um, it's before. It's before the enterprise funds. Okay. That's right. Here it is. Find it. So we've got the same thing. We've got a small snapshot, and then we've got the details. It'll start with street maintenance, special revenue. I guess my. Yeah, I guess I was thinking um, if we if there's nothing particular that we've got to discuss about policy on it, maybe we should just move through this very quickly and then go back to the general fund. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to Okay. Discuss. Then I'll just do the bullet right up front. Yeah, if everybody else is okay with that. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Colleen's just going to go through the bullets points because I said if there's nothing really of controversy or decision making here, we should get back to the general fund quickly so we can have a little time to talk about those issues that we might want to make just some uh, at least imme uh, initial decisions on. So, okay. To move so the street, street maintenance um, beginning balance is estimated at 193677 uh, Revenue is 630500 most of that revenue is from gasoline tax. Well, not most of it. Some of it is gasoline tax and then the transfer from the general fund. Expenditures for the street maintenance fund is 771695 for a dip in the reserve of $141,195. Um, let me see if I put my reserve in that. Well, there is no reserve because we transfer in as much as we need to cover the expenditures. Parks and Rec, um, beginning balance 85383 Revenue is $568,000. Most of that is, again, from the general fund transfer in to support the parks. That's $500,000. Expenditures are $594,370. So we'll be using up $26,370 in reserve. Still give us an ending balance of 59000 Um, we don't, the only thing in the economic development is the grant that we're getting in December mm. from Green County that we'll need to spend in next year. There's nothing in the green space. I heard the talk, the conversation, so there's nothing moving in that. Please. There is money in it. It's just we're there's not There's a lot of money, money in it. Yes. Actually, there's $225,990, but no money going in, no expenditures. 
in that for my for my budget. That's basically it on the um, special revenue. And then you did not find a separate thirty thousand something for the revolving loan fund. The revolving loan fund incorporated into the economic development. Okay. But yeah, I, the so reason why I keep. It's part of that total mm, okay. that I haven't found documentation because it's been cleared off the books in that term. Okay. But the reason why I keep asking is because it had been presented to us for several years that we had 30 something revolving loan fund, 120 economic development. So you and have those 120 were in economic development that includes whatever was the revolving fund. Okay. I, so I'm just double checking because that was not how it used to be explained. So so as long as we track the revolving it, loan fund was specific for loans. It wasn't just uh, it wasn't economic. Right, development. because it came out of um, I mean we all, we got a grant that we ultimately spent spend through. Um, okay, but as long as we've checked and we're dealing with 120 total. Um, that was I the only thing that I could find okay. on the book side. I don't have the legislation side of why it, how it changed, but that's years ago when I, I, I found that verbiage in that fund. So that money is included in that 121000 Okay. There is not a, a separate fund for it. So I guess what we do need to do, if, if this is accurate, is we need to pull out that revolving loan mm -hmm. fund money okay. um, as, as a, you know, a, a subline or whatever. Is there okay. any uh, controversy about that actual amount? I mean, are, are you solid on the 30? Is it exactly 30000 it seemed like it was. I mean, there was a bunch of. It should be in our budget last year. Uh, well, no, it's not. It hadn't been in it for years. Yeah, for I some looking. reason, these line items were just kind of talked about, but never huh. highlighted. I yeah. So okay. Okay. But yeah, but we want to we want to break that out. Okay. Um, I can do that. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments? Um, the and only other thing sense. is, and I guess now we're kind of moving into um, some of the topics Judith wanted to follow up on. So we had had this discussion about whether we were going to establish a community development fund. I think I also heard Lisa maybe saying a combined economic community development fund. Is that what you were getting at last Wednesday? Yeah, or? I was looking at. I was looking at my notes. Yeah, and we talked about kind of breaking it into separate types of economic development versus kind of community development. Mm -hmm. We talked about how some of the incentives, for example, for, for events would not, wouldn't necessarily fall into the category of community development. So if there was a way to itemize, it's in my notes about also about the revolving loan fund. Right, and, yeah. and before I lose track of it, uh, the spreadsheet I'm looking at still has the 50000 for the green space fund. No. no. Okay. No. So that's out? Yeah. It, yeah. Should, okay. it shouldn't be. The online packet's got, has that out. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think, I mean, that's something that maybe we should try to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, are we trying, are, are we talking about establishing a, a new fund for community development? Or? I feel like that honestly is a, a somewhat complicated question that we don't, uh, to me tonight we should identify the decisions we're going to make at the next meeting that are specific to the budget. That's what I would be for. So, you know, the $30,000 you guys are suggesting for a consultant, for PD, I mean, I think we should get it on the table. What are we talking about? And what is the proposal going to be? And I think council needs to bring, I, rather than a discussion, they need to bring a proposal, take, make a motion, second it, have a conversation. So, so, so you're That's what I'm suggesting. Rather table, than having these sort of ongoing conversations. We say what we want to have on the table, and at the next meeting, we yep. come to support it. Yeah. Whoever's. And then we vote. <laughs> I don't disagree, but before we go there, we were talking about a particular fund. I think the same with that. A proposal should be brought. Well, I, and so I think it's in line with the things that we need to decide tonight. Mm -hmm. Because also, if we're setting up a new fund, that takes some time as well. So we need to 
decide. Um, yeah, I, it, and I mean, it, 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 at a certain <coughs> point, Colleen, if Colleen doesn't have any direction from council, there's not much she can change. So council needs to give us some information and some guidance on what you want to see changed in here. Do you want what you want to add, whether it's added permanently or it's added for the next discussion? And then, I mean, for instance, I had three different lines under economic development right. from the last meeting, which was revolving loan incentives and community right, development. Right, that's what my notes are. And then the PD consultant, do you want that added in for discussion and it can come out? Do you want to see what it well, looks like let's, with it let's, in? Well, let's do it one at a time. So, um, okay, if we do it that way, is, does that mean we can set up that sub account without getting the official permission? I, I thought that was, I thought we said yes if, on if Wednesday. I, can, I don't know that we did say either way. I thought, well, I misunderstood. I understood, you know, that it was just an existing line having sub accounts. We could divide it, but if we were Of free, one we already have, if it's already a fund approval and you want an expense line for Right. That falls in that guideline of that fund. Okay, then but I'm okay. I can't create a new fund. Right, that way. right, okay. right. So I'm okay with doing fund. it that way then, and then that. I think we had said that the lodging tax would go into that community development line. Well, it depends. I think it. I think we got to know what's all on the table before we know that's where it wants to go. You know, what are the what are the? I mean, we have uh, some different monies that council wants to recommend. And uh, I think, you know, we already know we have a red budget this year, significantly so. Um, so until we know what it all is, and also the, the time it's going to take of staff who are already working extremely hard, um, I mean, I think we need to kind of judge that all. So, so in other words, I mean, sometimes that lodging tax is used for affordable housing, for example. So I'm not necessarily against that, but being used that way, but. You mean, what, what was that? Lodging tax. Okay. Are you saying communities use lodging tax for affordable housing? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, we talked about having a separate line. We did, but we haven't made any decisions, so I guess that's the, we may have. We, we talked about, and you're right, we didn't make decisions, but we did talk about using lodg lodging tax for actions that had a, an impact on community, yeah, like on community members. So my, my notes align with what others do where we talked about, this isn't new funds being allocated where we just talked about splitting economic development into incentives, community development, and the revolving loan fund. My only thing I'm saying is we didn't make any decision of Brian was saying we decided, and I was saying, well, we haven't really decided. I don't think those were my words. Okay. I, I just said Sorry. that That's what <laughs> we I talked about, you know, putting it somewhere. We talked somewhere about doing it. It sounded yeah. like we had agreed. So it. I'm just reiterating that because I thought that's what we're doing now, is we're bringing those things forward so that we can tee them up for our next meeting, right? Okay. So Sorry. I like this <laughs> idea of defi dividing it into three, and I'm going to, you know, propose that the lodging tax goes to community development because I mm -hmm. feel like that's what we committed to. Um, but, you know, we still need to make that decision. Yeah. Okay. So are we adding? Yeah. So we're, okay. A planning commission had asked for $30,000 to help with the comprehensive plan. I, I wasn't sure whether that got in the budget or not. It, it is penciled in under the planning's I think it's, it's under the general fund, right? Yes. It would be in the general fund. Yes. General I fund. saw it. I didn't look at the general fund because I didn't think we were going to be doing that tonight. I didn't say we were. didn't think we'd get that far, huh? Well, <laughs> I just looked at the agenda. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, I have been thinking about, you know, I had proposed and would like to see us have an affordable housing fund. Mm -hmm. However, I think we the Housing Advisory Board needs to do more work to decide how that would be set up, what the criteria would be. So I'm not ready to put that into the 2019. However, there are two things I would like. I would like to have the $30,000 that to go toward the 
affordable housing project that Home Inc. is going to be doing the pocket neighborhood as per their request. And I would like to ensure that we have the money to do the geotechnical and hydrological studies on the glass farm in 2019 so that 2020 we can actually be. And I would love to tell you what that is, but he's out of town until the 7th. So um, what I, I was sort of hoping that if we're not doing the green space, which was 50,000, that we could divide it between those two categories. So that would be like 20,000. Yes, I, I am in support of that as well. And just to say, after um, talking about this pocket neighborhood and potential monies that could be leveraged uh, with you know the $30,000 this year, the $30,000 next year for that project uh, that you know is, we're being asked to make some kind of commitment to, um, that commitment will allow us, will allow you know, through Home Inc., the leverage of a half a million dollars. So I think uh, that decision, I would like to see, well, I'm for it, but I won't be on the council to make maybe a final decision. But in terms of this year, this year, the $30,000, um, I wanted to support Mary Ann's recommendation on that. So we'll be bringing some kind of a proposal, okay. correct? All right. And Sorry about that. Last thing is I had requested $2,500 for the glass farm conservation area to be used for um, things that the volunteers can't do on their own. And would that come out of the commission budget? Hmm. I don't know. All right. I mean, it, I don't know where the glass farm is expensed out of. Uh, we have a, it's a subcommittee of the environmental commission. Yeah, and the, and the environmental um, conservation. So I, well, the Environmental Commission has never spent any money. Right. Really. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. Right. I, I mean, that that was my thought. Um, okay. And, and, you know, I, well, we can talk more about it next time, but yeah, I, I think that's a good, good are, thing to allocate. Are we going to do the commission budgets as a separate resolution like we did last year? Remember where everybody submitted and council did a separate resolution just to be very clear about which commissions had requested? I have some thoughts about this, that, but maybe since we're not really, cha I don't know that we're advocating a change in the amount. So in terms well, of process, had 30, 000, that's gonna well, but that's, I think that's a separate, that's, a separate that's, that's really the comp plan. So that to me is, is that economic development possibly? I, I wouldn't think of that as like part of that commission budget. I think that's a little different. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we don't need to go in deep on commissions right now but i but i i have a proposal that i could write up i was going to say some of the commissions aren't going to know funding they need till later anyway till they sort of plan for the next yeah year. i mean so well i'll just part of my thought is that we should <laughs> identify an amount and if that's 25,000 which is an amount i'm comfortable with that we reserve kind of an equal allocation to all commissions up until like a certain point, like up until April. And so that gives commissions time to think about their year. If they haven't figured it out, the pot opens up. So that's, that's my idea. Okay, so. Okay, I plan to ask for more. <laughs> I, I like the idea of having an affordable housing fund. Me too. Um, I think it will help us make balanced decisions about affordable housing costs for related to many projects. I just think we should probably anticipate, you know, what what else might come up in a di next year. You know, what uh, that, that is just I kind of. I mean, well, I mean, I know I heard a I heard three, but I just don't know if we can anticipate based on year over year what other requests might come up during the year that we don't have visibility into at this point. So I don't know. Just Go like ahead. we just like we had the difference in the with the resolution, the language in the resolution where we just called it housing as opposed to affordable housing. Do we want to just call this fund housing so we don't feel like we're hamstrung or we particular we have something particular in mind well, I focused just, what, for affordability. I don't think we I'm not prepared to start an affordable housing fund that delineates exactly how it should be used, how it should be set up. 
that, that's a big process. Mm -hmm. So I'm suggesting instead that we, we know we have a project in the line that is totally within our goal, the, the Homey Pocket neighborhood, right. and they requested it. And I'm, so I'm, I'm suggesting that we put money into that and that the other money go to the glass line. So I, and I'll just say, I know we're going to discuss this more, but for me, I, I come at it a different way. I am comfortable with setting aside money for housing or affordable housing, but the decision about, you know, the, the capital campaign ask and some of these other things, it's going to be hard for me to be ready to make that decision within all of this budget stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like we need some discussion about what all we're putting towards housing and affordable housing. Um, I also specifically mentioned during that discussion that I'd feel more comfortable if there were certain aspects of the project identified around infrastructure and things vis-a-vis yeah. -vis what our staff has said. So to me, you know, I think we might all have consensus around setting up a housing fund or affordable housing, whichever. Um, that next decision, I don't know. That's going to be hard for me personally because there's so many factors. Okay, well, we're not making the decision tonight. Right, right. Okay. Um, would we want to have a, that would have to be a fund that we'd have to get approval of from, though, mm -hmm. to set up. So that couldn't be set up right away anyway. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I yeah, was I mean, suggesting yeah. not having that. <laughs> It, set up yet. Yeah. Gotcha. If, if council knows they want to establish this line, we can prepare the legislation for the next meeting, read it, and get it to the state by the end of the year and have it set up for the first part of the year. Now, it won't go into this budget, but right after the first of the year, we can have the line added to the budget. And we can come back with a supplemental to fund that. New fund. I mean, I think. Time to do it. <clears throat> I think we need to discuss the proposal that Mary Ann's brought at the next meeting. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so, do we have any other big items? So, Mary Ann, I think you've covered yours. Um, okay. Should we talk about uh, the? Uh, study, police department. So that's in, we're going to gen, that's in general fund, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I so think that's we, what we're kind of like. Yeah, jumping around. Just a teeing up whatever's needs to be prepared for the next meeting. Right. And as we're leaving the special revenue fund, the only thing I added in there that is new is your um, URL fund. Right. There's a fifteen thousand estimated revenue and a fifteen thousand estimated expenditures. We will, we'll, of course, only be able to help whatever we've collected. So that was a new new fund that we've we got set up this summer right so I have a question about the grant proposal to the community foundation where is that it's submitted they only meet monthly okay so it'll be it'll be um, reviewed by the community foundation this month okay what third grant, what grant proposal that's the roundup program oh it's like we were gonna get like that kind mm -hmm. of matching oh, grant. I got you. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. or ask for so we'll skim through the general fund because I think you have more questions and, and it would be too long for me to detail out the totals if you don't mind. Should we detail out? I think it's I don't think much. so. I mean, I think the goal really was just to, and, you know, any of these items that we, we talked about on Wednesday or anything else to kind of get them in there for, uh, you know, a discussion on at the next meeting. So Council has the first part of the budget, and I did here at our workshop to add um, the, and this is where yours is at, Lisa, 30,000 professional services for a police study. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, new. it's not been added yet. We're it's we, penciled in this budget. So we're going to discuss that was it. The consensus. Sure. So, yeah. Well, we talked about adding it. At the yeah, I don't know that there was any consensus. There was no, okay. yeah, I would I say. I mean, we haven't discussed we, it. Okay. Yeah. Right. It was a proposal. So I will just highlight it and see what that is in my total right now right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Brian wants to did you want to discuss it any further right now or um I, you know I'm, I'm getting 
a little bit concerned that we're yeah, at 930. We wait, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I hadn't had in my mind that we were going to dig into this tonight. Um, but yeah, but I think a place marker is fine for some of these things. Um, and then we have to make some decisions. I, I would encourage that the, the proposals being brought by council, um, you know, bring, you know, bring clear information about what it's the proposals are. Any additional information would be helpful. If there's additional information to describe further what people are proposing. Mm -hmm. Are there any in there that people haven't? I feel like that proposal is pretty vague, for example. There is more. Be good to see it. Well, I think the one I, I will say the one question that came up on Wednesday that I wondered about was I think it was I that asked if other municipalities had done this, and um, I think we referenced Oberlin, Oberlin yeah. or someone that had not used it to reduce costs, but had used it to evaluate, you know, just sort of how things are working and policies and that sort of thing um, that that's a big issue for me I guess um, you know if, if I thought we were doing something that was you know helping us understand you know how to right size that budget I guess then uh, I'd be more compelled um, right. and I guess this does kind of enter into our discussion about whether we're going to have a commission so I mean overall to me when I think about something like this, um, I, I would want somebody to vet it further. And if it's mm -hmm. not a commission, then you know some kind of group. Um, oh, yeah. So, so we're, we're both discussing this and not discussing this, it seems like, at right. the same time. So since I brought this proposal, I'll just make a couple of statements. Um, Brian, you, you're, you're getting what I was trying to say when Marianne and I, when we developed this, and that is that, you know, sometimes professional services are needed. We want to try to avoid those expenses whenever we can. Mm -hmm. That's for sure, particularly when budget's tight. But I think there's two cases when professional services can be helpful. One is when there's a capacity issue, when um, either the village team, the council, or citizens just don't have the capacity to accomplish things at the rate that we need them done. Um, I think the Bowen study was a great example of the benefit that a professional services can bring to accelerate action. And I think the pace of change with, that we've seen with Justice System Task Force shows that this is very difficult work. It takes a long time. Um, I think the other reason that I brought this is the other reason why, in my experience, as a consultant for many decades, when professional services are needed is when specific expertise is needed and when neutrality is needed. So sometimes having an outside person, an outside point of view, who is both an insider in terms of having a deep understanding of any particular industry, but also detached from the situation, um, can really make a difference. And I would argue that many of us have deep passion about policing, but that it's important to engage in order to try to figure out about right-sizing budget, right-sizing cost, right-sizing policy, operations, all of that. We need a particular kind of expertise that isn't just a citizen or community member and it's not any members of the council. And so that's why I felt this is one of the rare cases where a professional services budget would be helpful. And I don't have any more specificity than this at this time because I wanted to get it out there into the budget so that once we get into the fiscal year, some money is there so we can scope it, so that we could think about an RFP, so that we could think about what we really want to know. But I didn't want to have it drop and be like second quarter of next year and have nothing there if we need it when this is one of the top focus areas of our community is our policing. Mm. So that's why this is here and that's why it's as vague as it is. I just want to note that we've got a very red budget right now. 
We also have a staff that's, uh, you know, taking on a lot of infrastructure need, which means the staff's working very hard and maybe, I think, in many instances on overload. Um, one of the key, we're going to have to prioritize. A couple of months ago, when the Justice System Commission proposal came, we were hearing how we need to let things sit and sort of see what we've done and look back and all that kind of stuff, which makes some sense to me. People need to take a deep breath. I think we're trying to do a lot, way, almost way too fast, right? And that was kind of the sense of the council. One of our very, you know, we have to balance our priorities. One of our key priorities is affordability and affordable housing. How we spend our money says where our real priorities sit. So I'm hearing a little trepidation about supporting an important affordable housing proposal, but, and, and I heard we were supposed to kind of let things sit because there's been a lot of change and kind of let things shake out a little bit and have a look back. And now we're talking about another kind of consulting proposal that will cause staff to have a lot of engagement and a lot of work when, when we're already got a lot of other priorities. So I think in terms of time, I don't think now's the time. If, you know, I hope the Justice System Commission proposal will be adopted by council. And I think that look back needs to happen. And then we can, you know, be thinking about is there some professional support that would help the work of not just the staff, but would include an entity which really represents citizens that, you know, when it comes to policing, it's a lot about values. It's not just about, you know, expertise and professional whatever. I mean, it's a lot about what do you want your police to be doing for you as a community. And that, you know, it's not really a neutral thing in a way. <laughs> you know, I don't see it as neutral, so I don't know. But anyway, I just, I feel like um, I'm a little concerned by the kind of tone of conversation about, you know, putting monies aside for affordable housing, and then we're talking about, nonetheless, putting this money aside for this, and, I mean, we're going to have to make some choices. We can't do it all, and I, so anyway, I just throw that out there. What I do just want to clarify, I hear every council member in support of affordable housing, but thinking about whether we're talking about 30,000 two times, you know, in over two years, mm -hmm. or if we're talking about it more the way we heard it from our staff's perspective, right? Thinking about infrastructure costs and other things along those lines. So, I, I mean, and I. You're sliding into another topic. Now. We're quite, right. Yeah, right. why don't we just cut it and have more of a conversation? I mean, mm -hmm. I just raise that because. Well, I think it's tricky, but I, I don't want, I don't think any council member is not in support of. Affordable I will housing. Work with you on coming back with more detail about this, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm not sure more detail will help to. We, I mean, sure, we well, could no, keep fleshing I, I mean, it out, but I, I think I think we can make a stronger statement both about why this would be helpful, how mm -hmm. it would be helpful, what criteria we would be using, mm -hmm. um, how right. it might be vetted. Right, and, and Judith, I think that you and I are in agreement here about the timing. I mean, this might not be needed until August, September, October of next year, but it, when there's a commission and they're doing work and if something is needed, it would be great if the budget's there. You know, that was what I'm thinking, not that it would be something that would start on January 1. I'm trying to think ahead, that's all. Not right away, but have it there when people need it. So yeah, Marianne, we can work on it some more. Okay. Do we have any other items that we should tee up for the next meeting? So uh, I, I just would like to confirm what I've written down to make sure that we include huh. in the next presentation. I have four things that I hear you definitely want to be in there. One is to take the economic development uh, fund and make sublines for revolving loan fund incentives and uh, community development. I hear that um, you want 30,000 or uh, an affordable housing line established and you want to start that process with I mean, the I thought we were going to make final decisions next meeting, not that they automatically go Well, in. Patty, I think Patty's asking about that one in particular in case we want to get that process started. Right, because it takes 
two reads of legislation, then the state has a month, and mm -hmm. so if it's a line that you want to, you know you're pretty sure you want to establish it, we have two, two reads to pass the legislation. If you change your mind, we just don't send it to the state. Um, well, I, I'm a bit of disagreement with other people about that. I, I, I'm actually thinking it would be better to wait. Okay. It's possible maybe that fund would be part of the CIC. I, I, I don't okay. know. That's why I was no, making the proposal no, no. I was making of a specific set aside for a specific project and waiting until further into 2019 to make a decision about how to set up an affordable housing fund. I'm not going to fight about it. <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, the, home, the affordable housing okay, so line is not tied to the budget necessarily. Okay. I mean, we could decide to do it later and then, and then fund it. And then $30,000 for the Planning Commission Comprehensive Plan Consultant is already in there, correct, Colleen? The 30, let me verify the dollar amount. Yeah. And then, I thinking it. And, so, and for now we're holding off on the PD Consultant until we I take that one out? discuss it further. Planning is 20, is what I have in. Okay. Is it supposed to be 30? Yes. Okay. Comprehensive plan and the planning's budget, 30,000. Right, for planning commission for professional services. Professional services. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm good. And take out the other for now. Well, professional I mean, I think. Or, I don't think we should put I it think, in yet. We haven't decided. Leave it. Yeah, I think the best way is just to kind of put these recommendations in and, you know, flag them. Okay. So, you know, okay. either, you know, different color or whatever okay. and just kind of. All right. And then we'll make those decisions. All right, we'll do that. I've written them all down. And so Glass good. Farm Housing Development. Um, yeah, that's coming. Uh, glass Farm um, Housing Development. Pre-development. Pre Call it pre-development. Is that for pre -development the Pre-development is everything you do before you actually put any houses in. Right, but that that would be under the affordable housing line, which you just <laughs> Well, it's you. not about no. affordable housing development. I mean, the Glass Farm will have we're going to make it. We're going to. That's the proposal is going to come, and we're going to make a decision about whether we're going to. I mean, do it where I'm, I'm not sure where that would come from, then, other than capital projects to extend the infrastructure. Maybe. So I, I don't know. That, you decide that where it comes from. I mean, that is the ultimate I, goal, right? And wouldn't that be the end state or the next state of the the study? Right. Is is to determine how infrastructure gets extended or is there some this is not a yeah. well this is not entirely that it's also it's about sort of the the um what can be built what it can sustain right. what the what infrastructure the, includes the house so the, you're talking about the geotechnical study at yes, this point okay study. yeah we just and the hydro right yeah so we have to wait for the consultant to get back to the office to tell me how much that's going to be i know but we're going to we're guessing yeah Twenty thousand, correct Who's the uh, it's Terracon. Oh. And we've got the 30000 for house for affordable housing, right? Well, it's not, uh, so it is, I mean, that's specifically for Home Inc. is what the recommendation is. So it's for a Home Inc. project. Yes. Seems like we have two different right. Right. So, right. ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, what We're I just bringing the proposal. What I was we don't need to make. We don't have to agree on it tonight. Now, what I was simply talking about was the line for affordable housing, where the fifty thousand dollars would sit, not the uses of the fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Oh, so you're right. It would be a particular project. Yes. Um, so I guess to be safe, since we have two proposals, if it's not much work to put together that draft ordinance or whatever it is, gotcha. then we could you know, go either way at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anything else? Um, the only other thing that I'll get with you on this is following up on what I mentioned about um, certain projects where I think there should be uh, support from particular groups. Uh, for example, John Bryan Community Pottery. So my suggestion for that is that we project kind of like half of those expenses and just put it in a revenue like area, just flag it and we can, that we can talk about it, but maybe just see what that looks like. Do you see what I'm saying? So like with the, uh, um, 
John Bryan Community Pottery, I think it was 30,000. So put in revenue 15,000. We don't know exactly where it's gonna come from yet, but that can at least help us set those up. And I will uh, uh, work with you on some of the other ones that I thought that should apply to. Okay. But okay. you're saying 50%. 30,000 for the expenditures for the pottery. For right. The that's in our, that's in our um, capital. Right. But add 15,000 because you're gonna get some outside yes. money. Hopefully to help pay for it. Okay, uh, I got that one. Another thing we talked about was st vehicles, staff vehicle. I I That's told Co I told Coley to take the new staff vehicle out, and we'll just use the old PD vehicle. I, I don't think it's the best solution, okay. but it's you know the budget is tight, so we'll. we'll I do thought there were going to be like a couple of options to choose from, so there were, and you chose. Is that what happened? One is the police, and the other is the staff vehicle. Right, so the, the police budget proposal then is standing to buy the new cruiser and then take their old one and have it be a staff car. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, anything else or that's enough? For Actually, just a quick question. Sure. So <laughs> our investments yes. are not reflected in any of this. Is that the correct? Investment. Like so, the investments that we have. Your interest that we get. All yeah, and our, Star Ohio and all that. Um, it's a funding in the general fund. Uh huh. Revenue source. Okay. So. But our reserves reflect that money as well. Correct. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Colleen. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so we are an hour yeah. past time. Um, so I guess one thing, Marianne, is uh, do we need to decide about the EPA letter tonight? Um, no, probably. Does anyone have any comments about the letter? There were two things, uh, two comments. One was we want to make sure that it's sent to the correct person. And there was the question about the date for the EPA letter, which I think just was not dated. I think we could get the month of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I emailed uh, Renee Wozak today and to ask her to get a copy of the original letter, which we never received. But I mean, I does count? So want to bring it back to discuss? Or are you okay making the changes and sending it on? I'm comfortable making the yeah. changes and I'm comfortable. On. Yeah, I like the letter as well. The only thing is um, we say something about uh, safety uh, at the end of the letter. I'd like that to also be added at the beginning of the letter. Um, it's the, I'm thinking about the second paragraph. I like that it talks about the gateway and why we want this to be property that, you know, is, is not just lingering as a brownfield. But I think in that paragraph, we should reiterate the importance of safety to our citizens, especially given proximity to the high school, middle school. Mm -hmm. Can you shoot me an email? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. I'll, I'll work with Patty on that. Sounds good. Okay, great. Um, all right. So we are now going to talk about the Justice System Commission and. Um, Judith, do you want to begin this conversation? Yeah, I'm not going to say much. We've kind of talked about this uh, a lot. Uh, just <clears throat> for people who might be here to, uh, from citizens who haven't seen all the documentation. Um, so this is um, a proposal to make a permanent village commission, a permanent justice system commission uh, that would further the work, and but in some ways it would be functioning in a different way than the Justice System Task Force. Um, we hope maybe more, you know, we did a lot at the Justice System Task Force, but we've also learned from some, thing, some things that we were not so effective so that we could really move forward with continuing to, uh, you know, improve our justice system that's here. But anyway, I was just going to read the first, the ordinance language um, that would establish the Justice System Commission. And it says, nationally, there is an understanding that the criminal justice system as an institution has need for reform. Unequal treatment by the justice system because of race, class, and mental illness have been identified as significant problems 
which need to be fixed, as well as an incarceration rate which far outpaces every other country in the world, every other, probably I should say, industrialized country in the world. Justice Systems Commission, Commission's purpose is to assist village council and the mayor in supporting a village justice system that provides respectful service in the interest of justice for victims, respects civil liberties, is proactively anti-racist, and fights the criminalization of poverty and mental illness. The Justice System Commission will be charged with making recommendations for policies and priorities that align the practices of the Yellow Springs Police Department and the Mayor's Court with community values of sustaining a just, safe, and welcoming community across race, age, economic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, ability, and religion. So that's all I'm going to say. And I don't know if Brian, Brian and I have been working on this proposal. <coughs> and uh, I don't know if Brian wants to say anything more. And then we just wanted to answer questions. Yeah, I think I'll just reiterate that, um, you know, I think we've all, we all seem to agree that these, these goals and, you know, the, the initiatives that we want to move forward need to continue. And so the thing that's most important to me is making sure that we have the capacity to do that. Um, and, you know, as, as I, you know, for example, the proposal that we talked about, uh, you know, just a few minutes ago uh, with potentially hiring a consultant to, you know, help us with some of the expertise in the police department. Those are the kinds of things that I want a group vetting uh, to help us get there um, because I agree, I don't think council has all this expertise. I do think we have people in the community that have some of this expertise and, you know, with all our commissions, if we're really serious about making sure that they're adding capacity, we need to think more and more about who's on those commissions and the work that they're getting done. So, you know, as a side note, as we start to look at goals and things, uh, I want us to be really tight about the effort that we put into our commissions and making sure that we're getting that in terms of delivering on village goals. Um, so my conclusion is that if we don't establish a commission, I'm just not clear how this work will get done, and that's why I'm a big supporter of it. Not to mention, you know, I, I, I have not changed my commitment to our justice system that, you know, started when I was on council, if not before, so began council. Okay? So, go ahead. I, I have questions. Um, so I've seen some changes, I think there are changes in, in the proposal um, that talked about involvement you know, ex officio involvement of police chief or designee and in the mayor's court and, and the mayor or, or her designee. Um, so have they offered themselves or agreed to provide that membership to, to make the, the body as it's proposed work as proposed? Because I, I don't, I am less in support if you don't have those pieces. Um, and, you know, we talk about expertise. Um, I, would, I would think that the folks who have the kind of expertise we're talking about are currently involved with the task force. Um, and I'm not saying you have to get commitments from people, but, you know, I don't, I don't know how many people are currently doing that work that are interested in continuing to do that work. You know, so, um, I mean, I'd hate for us to establish a commission and then put it on hiatus because of lack of membership. I don't think that'll be the case. Someone told me to be the other direction. You have too many people uh, mm -hmm. trying to get on. So, again, you know, that identified expertise that right now, as I understand it, everyone's stepping back, taking a break, and the involvement with uh, the police department and the mayor's office are, are I think, critical um, showstoppers, if you will, with me. If they're not involved in, a, uh, in, in uh, providing critical input on a continual basis, then I, I don't think we should set up a permanent body without those pieces. Okay. It's in there in D. I know it's proposed. Oh, I see. I'm asking if they've agreed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so I know historically there was interest in participation. I mean, Patty, what's, can you speak to Well, I, I, put this back over here. Um, 
when the Justice System Task Force was first proposed, I had a meeting with Mary Ann and Judith and explained to them that I felt very strongly that the police chief and myself should be involved in the task force. And they, we, were, we were asked to wait until they got their feet under them and established. And, and uh, so we didn't really have, that's when the procedure got a little confused and we didn't really have the input at the proper place and that. So yes, long story short, would we be willing to be involved? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can't speak for the mayor. I have not spoken with the mayor, um, so. Well, Pam has been involved uh, in both. She's been to a couple of our meetings when we were talking particularly about the mayor's court. Um, so one of the things Brian and I talked about is we wouldn't want to require them to come at every meeting. It's not kind of our place, but to, but depending on whether there's, um, there's uh, conversations happening there that are relevant to them uh, and that they, we would hope, would be, you know, able to participate at the designated time that we'd be meeting, so. Um, in terms of expertise, I, I think one individual who has been involved more recently is Beth Crandall, um, and I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, I and Judith, I know Lisa at one point, has had discussions with Vaughn, her son, who's very involved in this. Um, so I, I do think, Kevin, there's some expertise that has not been intentionally tapped that should be. Uh, but one thing Vaughn did also share with us is that um, we wouldn't want a commission that's just expertise, you know, specifically expertise in that field, but that there still needs to be diversity, you know, to represent the community you know, issues as well. Um, so, so I believe that, you know, some targeted uh, look at, you know, what we need on that commission uh, needs to happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, similarly, like Marianne's done a great job with the Environmental Commission. You know, when I think about kind of how, you know, we got that back uh, reinvigorated the Environmental Commission and, and that was a very selective process about who were the people that had the passion, capacity, and expertise. Um, so I, I think that's the way we need to look at this commission too. And, and I agree with all that's been said. Um, I guess I'm concerned about um, why there wouldn't again be the, the full expectation, if not requirement, that the police and the mayor are involved with. In that, we're not trying to solve world hunger. We're, we are dealing with the justice system and when does that not include the police and the mayor? Right. Yeah, I think the, the only one is really what Judith said. We, we don't have the power to require the mayor, but I think that she or her she designee expressed. would be interested. Um, so, and, you know, I feel like our village manager and our police chief do want to be involved in this work. However, you know, that ends up happening. So. Uh, do we have questions or comments from citizens? Athena? This is establishing a citizen review board. This is just making the system task force permanent into a commission. Yes. Yes. Um, and I will say that's another example of a proposal that I think is a really important one, but I'd like to have a commission in place to help us vet and make that decision. So. All right, thanks. Dave, come on up. I'm David Turner. You've heard me say some of these things in the past, but I put them all together for one last time, I hope. I don't think the council alone can implement the recommendations and other things, and therefore needs a group dedicated to help. That's clear. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that one. First, however, I think it would be wise, as you said in a recent council meeting, to step back and assess where we, all of us, are and to determine what to do next before considering a commission, a review board, et cetera. I've had a lot of conversations in the last few months, not just as a member of the task force, but as, as an individual, with a lot of people involved in different parts of this effort. Many have widely different views on what people and groups have done, what people have said, what groups plan to do or want done, and there's confusion, and well, I thought we were gonna do X. Oh no, we're gonna do Y. No, we're gonna do this. Well, that's not what I heard. You know, and there's, these aren't trivial things like what shape is the table. Um, 
I'm reminded of Pigpen in Charlie Brown, where there's this dust cloud and stuff floating around as he moves along, and this information and these attitudes and ideas and thoughts are floating around in here, and the discussion that you guys have been having is more of the same kind of thing, I think. Uh, lots of these pieces are floating around. There needs to be some assessment of where we are and where we want to go. We have accomplished some useful things and recommended and considered a lot of others, but in the end, what we plan to do should all fit together as some kind of whole, not be a piecemeal response. So far, I think we have a bunch of pieces. Uh, one of the things that I think has been missing, you know, we've focused on a lot of things in a task force, something that also needs to happen, which I think is key, is some resolution of the tension between the police department and the community. We've talked, we've got a taser policy, which is good, and a surveillance policy, which is good, but that's specifically focused. But this relationship between the police and people, real and felt, I think is, is going to stand in the way of no matter what we do until some of those kind of things are dealt with. As far as surveillance goes, you ought to put some surveillance on the transformers. Apparently, the squirrels seem to get in and <laughs> break things a lot, so find those bastards. And, with the surveillance technology. Yes, do. <laughs> um, I don't think there's a need to rush the decision. This has been and will continue to be a long and a complex process. It's always wise to occasionally pause and reflect on where one is in such an effort. And this is one of those times. We've been working on this for over two years. It's time to do it. We haven't, I don't think, done that. We, everybody, not just the task force, not just you guys. An intermediate effort can help determine a lot of things, including whether or not a permanent commission is desired or, ne or, or necessary. Stepping back and doing that assessment should precede any determination of new groups, whether to make the task force a permanent commission or anything like that. I think it would also be counterproductive to have too many groups working on the same things. First, let's determine what's needed and how many groups, and then create them. Currently under consideration is a commission, an advisory board, as well as a suggestion that HRC get involved as well. A lot of duplication is bad. Let's not build storage space. We've figured out what we need to store just to get started on something because we need to do something. I think council also needs to clearly articulate what it wishes to have accomplished and to define some priorities and goals and a process for moving forward. Um, this should be done with input from those that will be responsible for creating the recommendations as well as those ultimately responsible for implementing them. I reiterate my support for Mary Ann's idea of a box to put recommendations in and when you get everything then figure out what to do with them. Um, and I think that's about it. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from citizens? Okay. Um, I guess I do want to say that I feel, uh, especially in the one pager that we presented at the last meeting when we discussed this, uh, it does address exactly what you said, Dave. Um, we laid out what the commission would do over the next year. Uh, my challenge, again, would be if we don't have a designated entity in place that is directed by village goals, who is going to do that review and look back and processing? I, I don't. I don't see that. Um, I did want to say though. I, I didn't mention it before. What is in the surveillance technology uh, surveillance policy is a great store, start on data collection and reporting. I mean, that's like one of those elements where I saw a really nice section that starts to think more concretely about that. I mean, and that's just one example of the things that we're floating around on. I mean, we get some reports, but I'm not really sure that we're reporting on the data and evaluating that to ensure that our policy changes are making differences and that we're doing the right thing. Um, so again, I, I come back to, I think we need that dedicated group that's under our auspices to move that forward. And I was going to say, um, the, in the budget, there's a, an upgrade in, poli in the police computer system. Am I saying that correctly? Um, in terms of being able to collect data, and that's a place again where you know getting it's been thought about a lot um, to make sure. So you know the folks who have been the the data committee of the task force, you know who were finding there were some problems with how data you know how to, the capability of collecting certain data. Um, no, I'm wrong. Okay, maybe I misunderstand. But anyway, so I'll back off on that. 
I just was thinking of it as an example where if you're buying if you're buying new technology that you're you know definitely you know talking to the people who've been collecting data to make sure that it's capable of doing the the things that we really want it to be able to do. So, and, and, and I guess I would just ask another clarifying question. Um, the, the proposal talked about two years worth of work in the future. Um, and, and so the question uh, that I'd ask then is, uh, was it not meant for the task force to have, be under our, our species and, and accountable to us, just like a, a task force would be? Um, you know, so if, if work is identified for two years, you know, does that beg for another two-year appointment or a permanent appointment? And, and, and you know, is there always going to be, you know, work to be done? And, of course, agreed, it, it's, it's, it's understood that, that if the work is done, then that commission can be placed on a hiatus. But just saying, trying to balance those two things with here's two years' worth of work and we want a group that's accountable to us, um, then shouldn't a task force be just as accountable? I mean, the task force, if you're talking about the past task force? Well, I'm saying from this point forward, uh, doing a commission versus task I mean, force 2.0. <clears throat> the thing about it is probably one of the biggest problems with the task force is there is so much, there were so many areas of focus um, and there was not enough time. And so, you know, the time constraint of making it a two-year thing again and now we're going to try to do this piece and that piece. To me, you know, we can do, you know, Commissions can go on hiatus. They can, if things are quiet, they can sort of, you know, they can, they can stop meeting for a while and then if, you know, but I, I would be surprised um, if this, but this commission is going to be working under, I mean, the goals of the commission are going to be directed by council and by a public process with the community, just like every other commission. So um, we made some recommendations about what we thought those goals would probably be for, that could be for the next year. Um, but. Uh, when the goals discussion happens at council table, those more specific, uh, you know, the more the work of the commission would be more specifically focused, I would think. It's going to take a little bit of time to set it up, too. Um, but I guess I want to just put it on the, on, on the table as a motion that we, that we do, um, you know, because it seems like we're kind of done talking. I think, Lisa, did you have something else? Oh. No. Uh, so I'd just like to make a motion that uh, council um, create a justice system commission. Is there a second? <laughs> uh, well, if no, I'll second it. Okay. Um, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? I'm going to abstain. Abstain. Mm. Okay. So four ayes, one abstention. <laughs> um, and, and let me just say I'm, yes. I am in favor of the mission, I'm just not convinced, you know, that a commission, you know, is the answer to the, to the problem. And all I, the only problem I see solving is not getting the work done, just that two years wasn't enough time to do what, what was laid out before. So, again, I'm just, I am, I am in favor of doing the work I'm not convinced that a permanent commission is the answer to the problem. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, the last thing on old business is I just have two questions, really. Mm -hmm. All right. And this is setting up for the 19th, keeping in mind that we are going to yet again have a, uh, what I anticipate, a lengthy meeting with budget and whatnot. Um, but we have decided that. Um, our six candidates for the open council seat will give a two-minute statement at our council meeting. So my two questions are, uh, number one, do we need to have a Q&A period? Because another option is that I know council members have already been, like we always do, doing our due diligence. So we can get those questions answered ourselves. We can have conversations with the candidates we don't know. Or are we going to add a Q&A for each of those six people? Keeping in mind that's already 12 minutes with the statement, plus we're going into executive dis uh, session to discuss and then coming out to make our decision. Um, 
So that's one. The second one is what do we want in those statements? So what do we want to make sure that the candidates cover? I mean, I have a suggestion. I've been thinking about this a little bit. Two minutes. I mean, we want to, I would suggest rather than having question a Q&A or, mm -hmm. uh, but that we give people a little bit longer because okay. two minutes is not very long. <laughs> I mean, we give people three minutes to come up to the mic and state their, you know, whatever. This is important. So I would say if we give people three minutes, at least a minimum of three minutes, that maybe that's enough. Um, to at least make their statement about what they, and then, um, and then I would encourage all of us, including myself, because I don't know at least one of the persons, um, that you know we try to meet outside the meeting, as you suggested. And okay. Talk with people. So, any other thoughts about Lisa? Um, Go ahead, Marianne. Well, I'll wait. I'm wondering about the community. How will the community know in advance? Some things about the people. So, you know, so they were all in the packet. Um, all of the, you know, uh, the people, their resumes, yeah, their letters of interest. Um, reads the council packet. True. Um, not everyone read it. Reads. Not everyone reads the council packet. Although I guess the, pe the people that. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding. I mean, although a lot of people that are interested. I read them twice. We have put information on our Facebook page about. And I don't know whether the paper is going to put a little like paragraph about each person, something like that, mm -hmm. so that if someone has some interest, they can look at the paper or look at our Facebook page or something and see. Well, I, I would make an alternative suggestion, yes. Marianne, instead of putting up like paragraphs about people, because then we're picking and choosing yeah. from what they've submitted. We put up something on the Facebook page that says, if you would like to have the bios for the people who have applied for counsel, please request them. And Judy can PDF them into one packet. Well, they are. We can just link to, I mean, the packet was posted, it. so right. we can highlight that. Yeah, but that, who wants to wait through the packet? Well, we could, we could break no, we that just, part out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that's good. Um, I, I also wanted to say that, uh, you know, as we always do, we encourage citizens to contact us individually, send us emails, um, you know, just like any other issue that comes up. I don't know about other council members, but I've gotten plenty of calls about what people want to see represented and, and you know, a lot of other details. So I encourage that. I, we are not planning to have citizen comment or questions at that meeting. All right, so, so that would be something to responding to the to the to the uh, statements to the statements right. of this right um, I mean what certainly right now? um probably given the the hour no but you could certainly send us an email or, mm -hmm. or anything else mm -hmm. yes Lisa I think that the McKee organization does a really nice job on the on the election cycle and, and I think we have a lot a lot to learn about how that's organized to hear from people who are running for council in a very tight time amount, amount of time. Whew, sorry about that. And uh, one thing that I think is effective is that there's a, a few questions um, that, that everyone's asked to respond to. And, I, and it helps to structure, you know, your three minutes or four minutes or five minutes, however much. And so I wonder if as a council, we might want to come up with some higher order questions like, you know, based on your understanding of what's going on in the village, you know, what do you see as the priorities or mm -hmm. um, what's your position on affordable housing and, you know, I mean, like maybe three or four. Right. Well, and that was, that was my second question, right? Was okay. what, do we, what do we want yeah. them to cover? I, I think it would be helpful to have some, some uni uniformity and hearing response to some of the same mm -hmm. questions. That, I think that would help me to get um, and, and I also think that, I mean, I'm really going to be looking for someone who's done their homework, listened to the recordings of council meetings, you know, because we really need someone who can jump in. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that I would love to have those kind of questions. I'd be glad to draft a few. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I agree okay. with that, um, although I will admit, well, first of all, more than two minutes, whoever said that. I think three minutes at least. Uh, <laughs> Five is a nice number, but um, you know, three minutes at least, because we, we do that at least for, for every other citizen concern. Um, and I absolutely appreciate uh, Lisa's proposal, but I, in my mind, as I was reading everyone's information, had questions 
in my mind, and I was filtering uh, my reading of, of, of the statements that were made you know, through that lens. So, I mean, I think that helped me get a good feel for what I was reading based upon those statements. And, and it almost, some of the, uh, some of the uh, packet presentations seem to be outlined in that manner. So I think it's a good, a good idea. And I think uh, some of the candidates would be very well prepared to, to be able to do that, just fashioning some of the stuff they've already said. So I think it's a great idea. I mean, I would like to hear what the candidates think are important versus us trying to, you know, contain, you know, sort of put something on them. Like, you know, if, we, if we're going to do that, I think we should do it as a council, so that means we have to do it right now. <laughs> uh, if we're going to fashion some questions, I think they should be broad. You know, what do you think are the priorities of the village, um, our current priorities, um, what strengths do you bring, you know, what have you done, you know, what's your, you know, sort of the background, the, uh, those no, kind of I things. I think that would be about Those it. are pretty standard mm -hmm. things what that we want to hear. If, if people read their goals, uh, do you, what do you think about these goals? What uh, expertise, background, whatever do you bring to that? And what was the, the uh, just what you, what you think are the priorities of maybe in this period or something like that. Yeah, um, or what do you think is important for us to know about you? I don't know. I would want them very open because rather than what do you think about affordable housing maybe or something like that. Mm -hmm. Give them yeah. a chance to say what they think. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like we don't necessarily have any specifics then. <laughs> so I mean it's kind of the, I mean somebody that would prepare a, a three minute statement and you know we've explained I think what we're, what our expectations are. So. Are we good with that then? Yeah. Yeah? Marianne? Yeah. <laughs> they can read uh, the council minutes and what yes. we just talked about. And they're listening to us now. That's right. Watch <laughs> so the them. video. <laughs> no. um, okay. And, you know, and again, council members are always available, email, phone, uh, in person. Um, okay. So we have no new business. Uh, Patty. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, right. we do have a new business. I apologize. Yes. Yeah. So again, uh, due to the lateness of the hour, so I understand right at the beginning of this year there was some resolution or ordinance uh, put in place about uh, transient lodging. Um, I think we need to re revisit that. Not that we need to do anything now, um, but I know that there's been some traction uh, some work that uh, Chris and uh, his team have been doing. So can you, Chris, do you mind just sort of teeing up uh, the motivation for the work that you've been doing and we can get into it more later. Less than 90 seconds. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is, is that uh, we passed all the legislation on lodging tax about what effective a year ago. Um, there's inherent tension um, uh, with the concepts of uh, this transient housing, which we define as Airbnb, guest lodging of 30 days, less than 30 days. Um, and uh, there are economic impacts. Uh, this year for the Miami Valley Planning and Zoning uh, meeting, which is in December, uh, they, you submit topics. And the topic that Jennifer and I submitted was on Airbnb. Um, and the consequences to local communities and lodging tax, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that, that our experience in the village was something that was interesting and worth sharing. Um, also, uh, it was an opportunity to go out of the way to do some research to find out what the new trends are and then gauge that against what the, the community, because the, the, that pool of people who attend that, uh, that conference uh, is from Hamilton County, Miami, Green, Preble. I mean, it, it's a multi-county area. I suspect, I just, my prediction is, is that uh, the Yellow Springs experience will be somewhat unique because most of those places aren't destinations and Yellow Springs is a destination community and that's where you tend to see a, a negative effect on, on housing uh, costs. Um, and then you've got that tension, okay, it's an opportunity for people to make some money that, that helps them stay in the house, but then it can also have an economic impact that creates another barrier of entry because of the revenue it can generate. So um, anyway, that's in the first week in uh, December, second week, I think, uh, second Friday in December. So I'll happy to share what information we find and turn that into a report to council. Great. Thanks. Thanks. And, and you know, but, um, thank you, Chris. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know the math. I don't know all the numbers. 
but I do know that some apartments or houses have been effectively taken off the market and, and now been turned into uh, transit lodging. I think mm -hmm. if you take that number and then take the number of new dwellings that have been built, you know, I, I would submit at worst we're breaking even. You know, whereas, you know, we want to get two, two to three hundred or three to five hundred, uh, you know, new homes over the next several years. I mean, just in my short tenure on council, I think we've gone in reverse. Um, you, I will, I will take Birch three out of the picture, you know, but, but, you know, three, three hundred to five hundred thousand dollar homes are not the kind of things we're talking about. But minus those homes, when you, I think when you count the number of new houses, um, that have been added uh, to our housing stock compared to those that have been pulled off, it's, it, I feel like we're breaking even at best and probably going in reverse. And I think it's time to stop kicking that can down the road before we have a serious discussion about what to do. I do not have answers. I, there's a full spectrum of things that can be done, and I know some of them are not palatable to certain people. Uh, certainly, anybody who's early doing, already doing certain things will be grandfathered in, et cetera, I would imagine. So again, I'm just saying, I, I think we need to really have a serious conversation, uh, um, you know, after the new person gets on board, after uh, this meeting at Miami Valley has gone on, we got some more information. Uh, yes, we are a little bit different than all of our neighbors, and, and I think we just need to take it a bit more seriously than the rest of the world is. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Patty, anything you want to highlight? Um, no, just that um, the one thing in there that council did ask for was the, the draft transition plan. Um, and it's, it's three pages, it's two pages of written, this is this meeting here, there. And then it's a one page of um, a, a, a calendar. Um, and the reason I put in the other detail is because I can't get all that on my calendar in a way that you can read it. And obviously these dates are not set in stone, but these are the things that when I started thinking about who do they need to meet, who do they need to talk to, what groups do they need to go to, this is what I came up with mm -hmm. um, in the course of a month. So council had asked to see this. Essentially it's three weeks of my, me working with that person and then a week of them being kind of on their own and taking the helm. and me getting quietly away into a relaxing <laughs> retirement <laughs> for at least the short term. <laughs> yes, so. sounds wonderful. All right, cool. Um, so with respect to the village manager transition, this is just one part of it. You know, the timeline um, that uh, Marianne and, or, and I were tasked to work on. You know, there are other elements that other folks have been asked to do, and I get we, we need to, I think, put a stick in the ground on some of those things. Um, when I think this came up, you know, I heard some moaning, you know, when I said four to six weeks, and somebody grumbled two weeks. Well, uh, well, these are the things that need to be done, and, and so it's at least informally presented to council, and I think we need to come back and say, okay, no, all this stuff can be done in three days or, or, or whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, right. And so it also there's budgetary uh, issues uh, involved with this because of the overlapping sure. um, salary. So I think yeah. the I think overall the outline looks good. You know, I think one thing that we could consider as we get closer and who that person is is you know, will that give you an opportunity to take some of your days off that you never get to take <laughs> off or whatever? You right. Know? Um, but I mean, personally, I thought you guys did a good job. It makes sense to me. Um, I'm comfortable with budgeting for a four week. I, I saw in the in Colleen's budget it said six week. Oh, I thought it was three. Um, I I think she put six because that was the outward bound that I mentioned. Okay. Right. All right. So I mean, yeah. so you guys are actually proposing three, not four. Well, it's so this not. this is four. It's a four week. Yeah. Right. And we talked about um, if if other things came up. <laughs> Uh, that we would start this process that begins in the beginning of June, mm -hmm. start it two weeks earlier, mm -hmm. as, as much as two weeks earlier in, in mid-May. So that's where the six weeks came in. I'm sure, I'm sure that I've missed someone in there, and part of the reason that I would like council to look at it is because I'm sure I've missed someone in there that they should be meeting with or whatever. 
I haven't set the business meetings yet. There's time set aside for them, but I'm working with um, Karen on that. Um, well, don't forget so. there's also the interviewing process, so they'll right. meet a lot of people then. Right. Um, all right, well, I think we should bu budget for four, and if we can, you know, and, and if three is adequate, then that's great, but I, I see a lot of stuff in there that seems necessary to cover, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff, so. We, we need the, <clears throat> the timeline for the whole search process. So I will, how about for our next meeting, I'll draft, uh, I'll do a draft timeline, okay. um, since I did that the last time, based on this, uh, and uh, I will say, we're not getting a lot of hits, I understand, from our RFQ for a consultant. So, but rather than talk about that now, just that'll be something we can do an update on at the next meeting as well. Right. And the only other thing is the holiday schedule for 2019 is in there just because I didn't want to forget it and I have to get it to you by the end of the year. So there it is. And since you brought it up, that, you know, I counted there are 10 government, official government holidays. We are now at 10 holidays, so I think that additional one puts us in line with most governments, so. Um, okay, Chris, anything else? No. Judy? Nope. All right, so future agenda items. Uh, I'll mention the things that I have. Um, so uh, one of them was, uh, are we going to, uh, revisit this uh, the RV legislation is that something we're gonna put back on the agenda I have to say that uh, the RV had to do with the clearing of streets right. and, and a super large vehicle being in the way with regard to plowing and managed blocking the street uh, the van is an entirely different matter I don't know that it would even fall under that same ordinance. I think it's a completely separate discussion. But I, that's yeah, I, and I agree with Judy on that. I mean, if that if that's something we want to discuss, that's fine. We can discuss it. But I don't think it's going to fall into the same it, because that that's more of a parking and safety thing as far as it, as she said, plowing snow, emergency vehicles. A van doesn't have that effect. So, I think Athena brought up a very important. Concern, so I think um, you know. I would be opposed to moving forward with that kind of legislation. Okay. Um, um, you know, to try to say you know criminalize people who sleep in their cars. Okay. Um, any, Kevin, you had sounded like you wanted this well, issue to come. Well, I wrote RV Park, and that was I guess responding to Lori's concern. She said uh -huh. if there was a a place for folks to park things and maybe we, I think I said we'd give it a full discussion but there there are places there is John Bryan mm -hmm. which is relatively close here and in the, in, in they you know the the person in the van doesn't want to go to the mm -hmm. RV park or the campground so um, I mean what I can do is do a little bit of research on if anyone else has any kind of legislation on this if it's something that council would want I'm just not sure how I mean if there's I concerns about out. safety I mean maybe there's um, if people don't know each other for example and you know with that person you know I mean if there's some way to approach that kind of a question um, you know so people feel more comfortable with who that is but that I mean maybe there's something to do there okay but and if, yeah so Lisa you what are you thinking about this I this just feel like it's a it's a bigger question I don't think it's related to RV parking okay you know and I do understand that there's differences of perspective but I I strongly feel that we we mustn't take any action that punishes people for being poor but I also understand that if people feel insecure in their neighborhood that's a that's a concern too so I'm not sure how to balance it I think it's a big complicated topic well, I, I'm gonna uh, I agree it's complicated so why do that we then say that people can't sleep and things like that in their own backyard because we do have rules about that you can't you can't sleep in a tiny house on wheels you can't sleep in an RV more than 24 hours or something in in 
you can't have guests come and stay in your, your backyard in your and their RV for more than 24 hours or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Okay. Well, no, so I let's. Thought, so I I so, don't want us to get into a. <laughs> this, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but but one. We, we have a report of a situation. We don't know how widespread it is. So to, to say that we're automatic, we, you know, we want to change legislation for what might be an isolated incident might be extreme. The other thing is there may be tools that are available already within the code that haven't been explored, which is a staff issue. And the third thing I'll say is that you hired a resource person through PD to assist people who find themselves in situations. That may be an appropriate avenue to explore as well before we start getting to that, that place of, of legislation. And I don't think that's where we're getting. I, right now, I just want to, you know, get a feel for, uh, is this going to be on an agenda? All right. So I, I'm not getting a real clear feeling for that right now. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Sanctuary City, it sounded like we want to bring that back. Is yes. that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. It sounded um, the active transportation plan will be ready on December 3rd, so I would like that to be on the agenda for us to have a special report on that. Um, Justice System Commission ordinance. Yep, of course. And then, uh, you know, the I don't know, did you say the bu the budgetary decisions? And I think it'd be really good if we have it very well organized, like, you know, there's this proposal, there's this proposal, there's this proposal down that line. Mm -hmm. oh, we don't need to bring the EPA like that, right? Yes, we're good on that. Um, and I don't think we need to have a housing uh, line I, you know, discussion. I mean, for the housing board, mm -hmm. what I would like is that probably the last meeting of this year come back with a report and questions, recommendations. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the housing advisory board? I, housing advisory board. Okay. And it's not on here. Um, I, I don't feel that the uh, Economic Sustainability Commission is ready to bring a special report yet. We may have an update about the DCIC, but... But that's, that's a separate issue. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, we'll have an update about the DCIC, but we won't have okay. an ordinance, I don't think. Okay. Would you agree? Yes. Um, okay, so we've did got... You, did you want... We have the candidates. To, was that said already? Yeah. Draft ordinance to establish an affordable housing fund. Did you want that? Did, did you um, want that ordinance brought? That was. Yeah. So we will have an ordinance because that'll be part of what whatever decision we make. If that's that may be one decision we make. Um, and so the transient housing, I'd like that to be. Chris, when did you say that meeting was? December seventh. Uh, transient housing is the I believe the second, the first or second Friday. Se it's the seventh. Miami Valley that's planning, right. regional right. planning. So I put it down for January, if that's okay. That's, that's fine. Give you time to yeah. absorb. Yeah. Um, and then... The Gaunt uh, statue. What's that? The Gaunt statue. Yep. We have that mm -hmm. for the 19th. Did we get that answer yet? We don't, but I, I've continued to reach out. I think they haven't thought it through. You know, I think that's a new question. <laughs> okay. And then... Um, oh. And then I think related to what Athena brought up about the taser incident, I, we need some kind of update about that. I, I don't know what, what that is exactly. So, but I guess I'd like some kind of resolution about that. A report from, like some kind of a report. We did get a report. report. Yeah, yeah, the, the chief center. The okay. chief, chief center. the chief center. Well, uh, yeah, but that's I don't know if that, that was right. When I, I think what I heard Brian say is maybe <coughs> in the in the meeting in the public meeting. I think we need to address it because it's come up enough, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I want whatever you know clarity we can have around that um, addressed. And so I, I it's think one of those circumstances too. We've got this new policy, just right. to say, and kind of understanding, having a conversation. And so I think similarly with the uh, the issue of the vans being parked or whatever. I mean, I, I kind of like it's the same kind of thing to me. Sort of what Chris alluded to is is some kind of idea of of what if anything we're we're looking at there. I like the idea of we do have resources that um, we should be able to use. 
So. And, and I, I'll just pass on from Colleen. It would be her fondest desire to pass the budget on December 3rd as an emergency because she's got to load all of that stuff into her system and then get it to the auditor. It's a very time-consuming process. That would be her, her greatest desire. Not saying that can absolutely happen, but just so that you've got that on your... I feel like you're getting close. Mm -hmm. I do too. Yeah. Yeah, I think actually this has been a different process than in the past, but I really do think we are winnowing down on things, so I appreciate everybody's being involved. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. motion to adjourn? Motion. So move. <laughs> I already made it. All right. All right. Sounds like we've got many seconds. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks, everyone.